Good morning. Uh, I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, the Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. We are joined by the Committee on Technology, chaired by Council Member Ku, for an oversight hearing on New York City's cable television franchises. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, we have Chair Salamanca, uh, Council Member Lansman, uh, Council Member Ku, uh, Council Member Yeager, and Council Member Holden. This hearing will address issues arising out of the cable franchise agreements between the city and its cable television franchisees. Charter Communication doing business as Spectrum Cable, Verizon, Fios, and Altice. The city's cable franchise agreements expire in 2020, prior to which the council will consider a resolution to authorize the renewal of these agreements. Since the city entered into these agreements, the cable television industry has undergone significant change and uh, realignment, including multiple mergers and changes in media consumption from television to wireless. These changes have brought with them a variety of complex concerns related to contract compliance, including the availability of promised services, customer service, labor practices, procurement, and franchise fees. The purpose of today's hearing is to garner information about these and other issues relating to the existing franchises so that it will be prepared to thoughtfully exercise our authority when DOIT submits an authorizing resolution for our consideration. Hearings like this are important. As we all know, cable television services have become indispensable for full participation in the social, educational, economic, and democratic institutions of our city and country. To obtain these public benefits, the city grants private cable companies the right to use the public rights of way and, and conduits for their networks. These conduits and rights, uh, rights of way are the property of the city of New York and its residents. Let me emphasize, the cable franchises have been given the right to use the property of the city to provide a public benefit. And while they pay a franchise fee for the opportunity to use the city's properties, it is an expense that returns enormous profits to the franchisees. As stewards of the city, this body has a responsibility to conduct oversight, and our contractors have a responsibility to appear before us when asked. I want to thank the representatives of Charter and Spectrum who have agreed to testify at today's hearing. While I'm seriously concerned about Spectrum's business practices, I appreciate your willingness to be here and answer questions, some of which I expect will be quite challenging. At the, time, at the same time, I find it unacceptable that representatives from Verizon and Altice treated this hearing as optional and decided not to attend. The services that cable companies provide are public in nature and demand public oversight, which means the taxpayers who pay for the maintenance of the rights of way and the conduits that carry your wireless deserve to see and hear representatives of your companies account for their activities. I want to put this on the record right now. When we consider the resolution to authorize the renewal of the cable television franchises, I expect all three franchises, Spectrum, Verizon, and Altice, to be here. And I will do so with everything in my power to make sure that they are. Before we begin, I want to briefly highlight the significant issues with each franchisees that have come to light as we prepare for this hearing. Spectrum Cable currently has a non-exclusive right to operate CATV franchise in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island through July 18, 2020. Pursuant to franchise agreements between the city and Spectrum's predecessor in interest, Time Warner Cable. As we meet here today, 1,800 members of Local 3 IBEW are entering their 16th month of a strike against Spectrum. They have alleged, among other things, that Time Warner Cable and Spectrum violated collective bargaining requirements of the franchise agreements. They also allege that their members were demoted in violation of the anti-discrimination provision of the franchise agreement. They also allege that Spectrum provides customer equipment incapable of delivering advertised internet, internet speeds and then unfairly penalize technicians for making repeat visits to customers who complain about the service deficiencies. Subsequent to the Council's May 2017 hearing, 
Local 3 filed a complaint with the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications alleging that Charter Spectrum was in violation of Article 17 of the Franchise Agreement. In August 2017, Dewitt initiated an audit of the franchise with a focus on Charter's compliance with Section 17.1 and 17.4 of the Franchise Agreement. In February 2018, Dewitt concluded its audit findings that the NR the NLRB determination that Charter had violated labor laws constituted a default of Charter's obligation under Section 17.1 of the Franchise Agreement. In particular, Dewitt cited that the NLRB's finding that, Charter's that finding that Charter violated labor laws by punishing its workers for participating in protected union activities and coercively interrogating such employees about union activities. However, Dewitt stayed, that stayed its determination of default pending the resolution of Charter's appeal of the NLRB's decision. Dewitt also found that Charter failed to comply with the provisions of Section 17.4 related to hiring local vendors. When asked for documentations of its local hiring efforts, Charter provided addresses of vendors that were clearly unverified, some of which turned out to be self-storage facilities. Dewitt found that Charter made no effort to determine whether a vendor's employees were city residents, and that only seven of 26 vendors were actually located in the city. However, rather than finding, finding Charter in default, Dewitt put the company on notice that unless it undertook a bona fide effort to comply with Section 17.4, when, when selective vendors Dewitt would find it in default during a subsequent audit that would take place within the following 12 months. On June 14, 2018, the New York State Public Service Commission ordered Charter Spectrum to pay New York State $2 million for its, for its martially bent, uh, breaching the conditions, materially breaching the conditions of its merger with Time Warner Cable related to its statewide build-out. The PSC is also currently requiring whether, uh, reviewing whether Charter is paying adequate franchise fees to the city. Though they are not here, I'm prepared to ask questions about Verizon's contract as well. Verizon first began to build out its fiber network within the city in late 20, uh, 2004 to provide internet service, but not cable TV. Verizon needed to obtain a franchise from the city in order to offer cable television services. To maximize the profitability of its network in 2008, Verizon entered into a cable TV franchise agreement with the city. The agreement required that Verizon's fiber optic service, Fios, passed all households in the city by 2014. After fielding complaints from customers about Fios's build-out, Dewitt initiated an audit against Verizon regarding the build-out of Fios on September 17, 2014. In June 2015, the audit's primary findings were that the company, one, claimed households as claimed households as passed with fiber optic cable when there was no fiber connection to the block on which the households were located. Systematically refused to accept orders for residential service, not only before it had passed a household, but even well after it claimed it had passed a household. Systematically failed to meet its six months to 12 months deadline to fill non-standard installation orders for service to residential buildings and broadly provided a broadly provided the public with misleading information with regard to Verizon's obligations. On March 3rd, 2017, the city commenced a lawsuit against Verizon New York Inc. and Verizon Communications Inc. The city's complaint states that definitions of pass all households would have required Verizon to have fiber up and down each street and avenue in the entire city. The city claims that Verizon has defaulted on its obligations both to build out its network and to undertake the process for providing service were required by the potential subscribers. The complaint seeks a judgment for specific performance directed that Verizon and its New York subsidy comply with the franchise agreement in full. This case is pending. And finally, the city renewed its franchise agreements with Cablevision Systems in 2011 to cover services in Brooklyn and the Bronx. The last city audit of Cablevision now operating as Altice in New York was in 2010. However, to our knowledge, there are pending investigations of Altice's performance under the agreement. There are no pending, sorry, there are no pending. 
The committee expects to hear testimony in connection with the cable television franchise agreements, the business and customer service practice of the franchises, and how the council can better represent the public interest when the next cable television franchise author authorizing resolutions comes up for review. The committee looks forward to hearing testimony from all interested parties. And now I want to recognize uh, Chairman Ku, who will offer some remarks from the Committee on Telecommunications, on, on uh, Technology. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank everybody for coming today and Chair Moyer for his statement. Uh, my name is Peter Ku, and I'm the chair of the New York City Council Committee on Technology. As you have heard, we are here to discuss the city's cable television franchises. New York City requires cable companies to obtain franchises if they wish to operate within the five boroughs and to want their cable through the city streets. Franchises contain several operating uh, conditions and significant protections for consumers. However, there have been a number of complaints made against the various cable companies that currently have franchises. We have heard complaints about Charter Spectrum and their predecessor, Time Warner Cable, regarding their compliance with the franchise agreement with the city. One set of provisions in Spectrum's franchise involve collective bargaining and employment services, both of which Local 3 IBEW has alleged Spectrum is in violation of 15 Time Warner cable employees over the age 50 alleged that they were demoted and replaced by newly hired, less qualified younger employees to fill their roles. The case is currently in the discovery phase. In addition to allegations of unfair labor practices, there have been reports and lawsuits accusing Spectrum of providing deficient internet services to their customers and falsely advertising about their services. The New York State Attorney General filed a lawsuit against Spectrum detailing a number of ways that Spectrum that uh, TWC defaulted New Yorkers over internet speeds. Excuse me. The lawsuit alleges that from January 2012 through February 2017, the company violated New York State consumer protection laws by promising to deliver inter internet speeds they know they could not deliver to subscribers, and by promising reliable access to online content that they know they could not or would not provide. The Attorney General's complaint alleges that since 2012, Spectrum Time Warner Cable has advertised internet speeds of 100 to 300 megabytes for city customers, but company continues to lease modems that are technically incapable of providing speeds above 20 megabytes. Not in March 2017, the city commenced a lawsuit against Verizon New York and Verizon Communications, claiming that Verizon had defaulted on its obligations both to build out its network and to undertake the process for providing service where requested by potential subscribers. Reliable and affordable internet service is a modern day necessity and a fundamental right for people. Yet, the fact of the matter is that there is incredibly high cost associated with building, with building out the infrastructure needed to deliver cable and internet service. As a result, there's very little competition in this industry, only, and only a few companies for companies and only a few companies for customers to choose from. In New York City, most people usually have one or two companies to choose from their internet and TV, and we must not allow companies to take advantage of the subscribers, uh, of the subscribers 
and offer subpar, over costly services. Companies like this must not use their privileged position to operate in any way that please and provide subscribers with subpar services and violate agreements with their employees and the city. To some extent, we have franchises to protect against these dangers. And these franchises are only effective if we actually monitor and enforce them. I hope this hearing will shed light on New Yorkers' experiences with our cable franchise and determine that and determine what, if anything, we must do to move forward. I look forward to hearing from the panels today and would like to thank the Technology Committee and the land use staff for putting together this hearing. With that said, I also like to recognize um, the tech committee members, Council Members Holden and Council Member Yeager. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Uh, we are joined by uh, the public advocate, uh, public advocate James, and we are going to uh, hear her remarks. Thank you for attending the hearing. Thank you, Chairman Moya and uh, Chairman Ku, for holding this timely oversight hearing on the city's uh, cable franchises and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Last year, following considerable discussions, the city of New York was forced to bring suit against Verizon for the company's failure to build out files throughout the city by 2014. Verizon receive, uh, received uh, favorable terms in its franchise agreement with the expectation that the company would bring internet service to every corner of the city. We had challenges with Hurricane Sandy, but it is 2018 and nearly a million New York City residents still do not have access to Verizon. And when the state agreed to allow Charter Spectrum to acquire Time Warner Cable, it was contingent upon their pledge to bring cable and broadband service to 145,000 underserved and unserved households throughout the state. Because internet access is not a luxury, it is a necessity. And because the digital divide in our city is real, and it exists because of a lack of investment in high-speed internet in some of our communities, and that also results in a lack of opportunities to parts of our community. And so we've left countless number of individuals behind. Unfortunately, Charter Spectrum, like Verizon, has not lived up to its promises. And the State Public Service Commission just fined Charter Spectrum for misreporting or double counting 12,000 New York City homes they were already required to serve under the franchise agreement with the City of New York. Charter has been sued by the New York State Attorney General, as was mentioned, for promising New Yorkers internet service they knew they could not deliver. And as a strong proponent of net neutrality, I look forward to seeing that case to conclusion. In order to obtain the franchise agreement we consider today, Charter promised the city that they would honor workers' rights to collectively bargain, refrain from discrimination, and to use local vendors. Three issues that I have advocated for all of my public life, and three issues that I take very serious, which is why I decided to come to this hearing this morning and which is why I look forward to the discussion. You see, the, the NRB, NLRB found that Charter violated labor laws by punishing workers for participating in protected union activities and coercively interrogating such employees. And as a city audit determined, they had all but ignored their obligations to hire local vendors, and, and let me add also um, minority and women-owned vendors and they stand accused of engaging in discrimination against older workers, and there appears to be some credibility um, to that evidence. None of this ex is acceptable in the city and or in the state of New York, and unfortunately, none of it has been fixed. And as of today, 15 months later, thousands of New Yorkers are on, are on the picket line, middle-class workers, individuals with families, and unfortunately, things have only gotten worse. I believe that Charter Spectrum can be good partners. 
that we can move past these many transgressions and bridge the digital divide in our city and put people back to work. Verizon, too, still has a chance to redeem its past failures, but as these franchise agreements come up for renewal, and as the public advocate of the city of New York who has a vote on that committee, and perhaps maybe the next attorney general of the state of New York, we need to see real progress and ironclad assurances that they will abide by current and future obligations. The telecom companies do not have an inalienable right to merge or to run their cables through our city streets without any responsibilities to the customers that they serve and to live up to the laws of the city and the state. Promises made must be promises kept to the city, to the state, to workers, and to customers. We must maintain the middle class as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and this company has a responsibility and a duty to do that. And I reject any um, organization that would, uh, that would uh, continue to ignore the pleas of elected officials and the pleas of New Yorkers. And so I call on these companies to do the right thing and to do it now. I look forward to the testimony and I look forward to the line of questioning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, we are joined by Council Member uh, Rodriguez and uh, Chair Salamanca has a few remarks he'd like to put on the record. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya and Chair Ku. Uh, I really want to thank you for putting uh, this uh, hearing together. Uh, just very briefly, you know, today's hearing is on the city's cable television franchise, which means the entire five boroughs, the entire city of New York, all five boroughs. We have three franchise providers, Spectrum, Verizon, and Altice. And for, um, for Charter, I, I wanna thank you for having the courage to show up today and have a difficult conversation uh, with us. Um, and I just want to point out that Alt Altice and Verizon, you have shown a level of disrespect to this council and this committee by not, showing up, by not showing up today at this hearing. And this level of disrespect will not be forgotten uh, when we have more conversations on the extension of these franchises. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. And now we are going to ask the council to swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand. Please state your names. Michael Pastor. Andrew Manchel. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in response to all council member questions? I do. I do. You may begin. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Moya, Chair Ku, Chair Salamanca, and members of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises and the committee on technology. My name is Michael Pastor, and I'm general counsel to the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, commonly known as DOIT. With me today is Andrew Manchel, DOIT's Assistant Commissioner for Franchise Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the city's cable television franchise agreements with Charter Communications, also known as Spectrum and formerly Time Warner Cable, Verizon, and Altice USA, also known as Optimum or Cablevision. Since these franchise agreements are set to expire on July 18, 2020, this hearing is timely and appropriate. It is the responsibility of both the administration and the city council to review each of these companies' fitness to continue their cable television franchises in our city, and we are certain this hearing will be an important part of the renewal process. First, I'd like to provide some context for DOIT's role as franchise administrator. A franchise is the vehicle the city uses to select and administer services for New Yorkers that require the use of public assets such as sidewalk space by private companies. Due its authority to negotiate and manage franchises is granted in the city charter. Our franchise agreements govern the installation and maintenance of wire, cable, optical fiber, conduit, antenna, and other structures on, over, and under city streets and sidewalks to transmit video, voice, and data services. The primary purpose of franchise agreements is to ensure that consumers receive reliable service from telecommunications companies. That includes setting out parameters for responding to customer complaints, speed with which customers can access customer service, quality of service, et cetera. We are committed to ensuring these service commitments are followed by our franchisees. 
As the Council is well aware, the City has confronted several challenges related to cable television franchisees in recent years. For example, the City developed and entered a franchise agreement with Verizon in 2008 that, if it had been fully performed, would have been a true game changer for the cable consumer. That agreement attempted to make Verizon service an option for every single New Yorker. This would have increased the amount of competition for cable service and created competition where there typically is none. Unfortunately, the City has determined that Verizon failed to make good on this commitment to the City. After years of disputes about Verizon's obligations under the agreement, the City filed a lawsuit against Verizon last year in an effort to compel the company to keep their promise to New Yorkers of putting telecommunications infrastructure required for the provision of cable service directly in front of every home in the City. This matter is pending in the New York State Supreme Court and we look forward to a pos positive resolution for consumers. More recently, we carefully scrutinized our franchise agreement with Charter Communications, the purchaser of the Time Warner Cable franchise. We conducted two audits within the past six months, one, one of their financial records and payments to the city, and another on their compliance with the labor-related provisions in the franchise agreement. As you may know, each cable franchisee is required to submit 5% of their gross revenues to the city. As a result of the first audit, Charter received a notice of default from Do It for failing to submit financial information in a timely manner. This was subsequently corrected by Charter and that audit remains ongoing. Our audit into Charter's compliance with labor-related provisions did not find the company in violation of the relevant requirements of the agreement. This does not by any circumstances mean that the company is in good standing with respect to its labor relations policies and practices. Charter is required by the franchise agreement to utilize vendors located in, the city, in New York City to the extent feasible. Our audit found that Charter has been using an overly broad definition of what it means for a vendor to be located in New York City a term that was not sufficiently well defined in the agreement. As a result, following the audit, Do It provided the company with detailed criteria for its use going forward. Do It will commence a follow-up audit within weeks to ensure that the company adheres to the revised, stricter standards for choosing local vendors. We are also prepared to take action pending the outcome of any, any um, National Labor Relations Board adjudication in the event charters found in violation of federal labor laws. We continue to wait, await the results of the federal review of charters' labor practices. These audits took place against the backdrop of the protracted labor dispute between Charter and Local 3 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. We echo, we echo Mayor de Blasio's strong and consistent call for Charter to deliver a fair contract to the 1,800 hardworking men and women who have been on strike for over a year. Do it will continue to aggressively use all tools at our disposal to hold Charter accountable to the provisions of our franchise agreement within the constraints of federal law. We are in an important initial stage of the process to renew the company's cable television franchises as required by federal law. As we have indicated at other hearings, a company's standing on a variety of factors, including compliance with the current franchise agreements, are assessed as part of this process. We've already begun to solicit comments from the public via a form on DOIT's website to evaluate future cable-related community needs and interest in communities and to assess each cable provider's record of performing, of performing during the current franchise term. The next step in this process will include the passage of an authorizing resolution by the Council's Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. This resolution, like others passed in previous years, would authorize Do It to grant non-exclusive franchises for companies to use public rights of way for the provision of cable television services in New York City. To be clear, this authorizing resolution would simply allow Do It to enter into cable television franchise, franchise agreements, and they're not specific to any one company. It would be the starting point for Do It to begin its evaluation of past performance of cable companies and negotiations with them over the future terms and conditions of the franchise agreements. The purpose of the authorizing resolution is to lay out the framework of what the franchise agreements may contain. With that framework in place, the city must then undertake a number of assessments before negotiating the terms of the next franchise agreements. This includes an examination of the company's ability to meet the future cable-related community needs and interests, and each cable provider's record of performing during the current franchise term. Over the next two years, input from the public and the New York City Council will be crucial in making these assessments. I'd like to take the opportunity to reiterate, to reiterate that our ultimate responsibility as franchise administrators is to ensure that, that our franchisees who are being granted the privilege of using public rights of way to build out their networks are providing the best cable television service possible for New Yorkers. It is our shared interest to make franchise agreements as strong as state and federal law allow and we look forward, we look to the council to assist us in that effort. This concludes my prepared testimony, testimony and I will now gladly answer council members' questions along with my colleague, Andy Manchel. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Just a couple of questions. 
Um, Article 7 of the Spectrum Franchise Agreement uh, provides that Spectrum shall offer customers valuable and attractive competitive options in terms of the quality, scope, and technical sophistication uh, of the service it provides. Uh, what constitutes a competitive option in the market where cable services are provided by a monopoly or at best a dual, uh, a dual uh, uh, policy here? Sorry. Duopoly. I gotta get in places. Thank you for your question, council member. Uh, as you know, the uh, cable franchise that we administer is limited to cable service, and the, we are also limited with respect to our ability to mandate content to the cable providers. What we do attempt to do is to make sure that cable services are provided at an adequate technical quality and an adequate speed, and that customer service provisions, customer service um, is provided at the highest possible level. Also following that, uh, Altis is providing voice activated remotes with uh, series menus indexed by season and episode, while Spectrum is using the same remote and search technology from five years ago. Would Spectrum service be considered a competitive option if it were not operating as a monopoly? That's an interesting question that I'd have to give some thought to, but um, it is always our goal to ensure that uh, cable customers in New York are receiving the highest possible technology, the latest and what's most um, current in technology. On the other hand, the franchise agreement doesn't, doesn't require any specific technology. Um, we do have uh, the capacity to jawbone people into improving their service, and I would be pleased to receive more information from your office on this and to speak with the providers to make sure that they're providing the highest level of service. Happy to do that. Um, also, does, does do it keep track of all the different cable boxes, remotes, search functionalities, technologies, and services offered by the various cable television providers in the city? Our focus tends to be on the cable company's presence in the right of way and on public property. So we're very familiar with the t technical equipment that goes into the trenching and onto, light, onto poles and uh, the, the, the boxes that cable companies put on the street. We're, we're less concerned with the te in-home technology. And before this subcommittee takes up the next cable television franchise authorizing resolution. Could do it provide us with a matrix uh, that illustrates the difference between the cable television technologies and services provided by each existing franchises, franchisees and the prices they charge for each? Certainly. Thank you. Um, my second question is, why is the city uh, suing Verizon? Yes, council member. So um, after a long period of disputes with um, Verizon, I mean, if I could just step back for a minute, I mean, the, pur the purpose of the Verizon agreement was to get Fios everywhere. Um, and uh, the agreement required that. Uh, so we ultimately determined as a last resort that the only way to uh, get Verizon to comply with that provision was to take them to court. Um, so it was our view, it's an objective-based lawsuit, it seeks specific performance uh, of their obligations under the contract, uh, and that's why we, we took them to court. Okay. And Verizon recently began offering Fios to more households in the city, but with basic cable packages that omitted the 24 hours news channels. In effect, the cost of cable news is a premium option for Fios. In Dewitt's opinion, is this competitive pricing or anti-competitive pricing? So I, I don't know if I want to opine necessarily on the competitive nature of it, but what I will say, council member, is that we do um, uh, operate uh, on a complaint basis to receive complaints. And if we received a complaint of that kind, and we now have, obviously, from you, um, we would take it seriously and look into it. Great. Uh, Article 17.4 of the Franchise Agreement provides that 
franchisees will, to their best of their ability, use local contractors. Uh, Dewitt's recent audit concluded that Spectrum uh, was not complying with this provision of the franchise agreement and warned the company that they would be found in default if the conditions persisted during the subsequent audit. Can you describe what a local contractor is under the contract and what Spectrum has been calling a local contractor? Sure. So one of the issues we face is that the what is a city vendor in the contract was not very well defined. Um, but Charter's position was that essentially if there was any city presence of any kind in the five boroughs, that was a city vendor. So one address, for example. And as we laid out in our audit, we do not believe that is an appropriate um, view of what it means to be a city vendor. Um, and what we instructed Charter to do effective immediately from the time of the audit was to start to look at certain criteria that they had not been looking at uh, to determine um, whether a vendor was in the city. And those criteria include um, whether they had registered with the Department of State uh, as being uh, registered to do business in one of the five counties of, of New York City, uh, other things like what is happening at that address. So it's not just enough to say you have an address, it's, it's more important to say what is the nature of the business of that address? Uh, are there employees there? What's the nature of the presence? Um, so I think that as you pointed out in your intro, um, Chair, you know, to say that there is a, a for example, a self-storage um, in the five boroughs, that doesn't tell you anything about whether it's a city vendor. Um, and what we'll be looking at in our follow-on audit is two things. One, uh, have they started to uh, approach this inquiry using the definition as we've um, instructed them to do? And also, very importantly, have they been recording that effort so that, so that it can be audited? Because that was one issue we found in the original audit is that there wasn't uh, a record of the process that had been undertaken. Um, and we want to see both those things the next time around. Thank you. And how many New York City residents uh, do you think would be employed as contractors or employees of contractors under this contract if Spectrum were complying with its terms? So it's a little bit hard to answer that question, um, Council Member. I mean, you make a presumption that a city vendor may or may not hire fr from locally, um, but that is a bit of a presumption. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm able to answer that question with any precision. I think what I will say, though, is that the intent of the provision uh, is to incentivize these companies that are in the city to use vendors that, um, that are among us, um, who may very well have many city residents as workers. So we don't know how many New York City residents are actually employed by Spectrum pursuant to the provision of the contract? I, I do not have, at least not have, I, I may know, the agency may know it, I do not have handy the number of uh, employees that are, high, that are employed by charter in this jurisdiction. When Dewitt requested uh, documents uh, in compliance with this provision of the contract, what did Spectrum provide and did it comply with your document request? As it related to, so I'm, if I could just split up the question, uh, Chair, if it, the question is about the, um, uh, the labor provisions audit, um, what they provided was, you know, uh, e evidence as to what they viewed as a city vendor addresses and those types of things. Um, and I think that we felt that we weren't g given enough, or maybe that en not enough existed. So if, if your question is just about Article 17.4, that's what, that's what they gave us and we expect to see more the next time around. Can you describe uh, how Spectrum has evaded compliance with the uh, provision of the contract or concealed evidence of its actual contracting practices? Uh, I'm sorry, can you, re can you repeat the question? Can you describe how Spectrum has evaded compliance with provisions of the contract or concealed evidence of its actual contracting practices? So I do not believe we have any evidence of concealment uh, in the instance of uh, Article the Article 17.4 audit, we found that they didn't have documents recording their efforts uh, with respect to the Article 17.1 audit, uh, which was the financial audit. Um, we found that they had not given us enough, and they did cure that um, in terms of pr they then provided more documentation as it related to revenue. Is there any evidence Spectrum has changed its hiring or procurement practices to comply with the provisions of the contract? So we have no evidence of that to date, um, but the entire purpose of the audit is to determine that very question. Um, and originally in our audit, we had um, indicated that we'd be doing uh, an audit within the year to come, and the purpose of, of that time frame was to sort of give Charter time to actually do what we instructed them to do, but um, 
we as an agency feel like enough time has elapsed that um, we should engage with Charter soon to determine whether they change their practices. And when will do its next audit of Spectrum B? Uh, with respect to the labor law, we expect it to commence within weeks from now. And according to the New York State Public Service Commission, uh, Charter Spectrum claimed more than 12,000 New York City households as part of its build out for service to underserved and underserved areas across the state. How many households in New York City uh, franchise area are supposed to be connected to Spectrum cable television services uh, but are not? So uh, we don't actually have any evidence of, of any particular residence that should have um, cable service but does not. Um, I just want to point out, Chair, while I have the opportunity, that the, the key point from the PSE's most recent announcement um, was that there had been a violation of uh, the, the merger conditions, uh, the conditions on which the PSC approved um, the merger. Um, and that's where the fine, as some of the, the introductory marks um, comes from. That doesn't, as we see it, relate to a specific uh, violation of a franchise agreement. Um, but I will say we are following the PSE's action very closely. Um, and, and, and I will also point out that another uh, portion of the PSE's uh, uh, activity relates to revenue, uh, which of course we are already auditing that, um, and, and we're doing that before they announce their, their action. Just a few more questions. Um, is Jewett aware of any activities not mentioned in its audit that it believes constitutes efforts to interfere with collective bargaining provisions of the franchise agreement, and have such matters been referred by Dewitt? or any other third party to the New York State Public Service Commission or the National Labor Relations Board? So the only matter of which we're aware is, is a recent, uh, there, there appears to be a recent action to um, decertify the Local 3. We just became aware of this. Um, the, the action seems to relate, at least what we were able to determine independently, uh, to whether or not the person who filed that petition was appropriately, was lawfully able to do that. And the NLRB found, I think, within the past week um, that uh, that person was lawfully appropriate to do that. But um, I will say we are, uh, haven't, to answer your question, Chair, have not referred that particular uh, matter to the PSC as we just became aware of it, but we are investigating it. Um, and there's two more questions. Uh, the public educational and government uh, PEG access channels are an important public service for my constituents. Uh, while PEG and NYC cable subscribers receive programming that is not available on commercial stations and that address local concerns directly and in depth. In the next authorizing resolution for cable TV franchises and in the upcoming cable renewals, will do it commit to enhancing the PEG access channels so that channel cap uh, capacity and financial support for capital and operating expenses are provided by the cable franchise ease at levels that fully serve the community's needs and interests? Council member, I appreciate the question and uh, we are about to engage in a two-year process which will include the negotiation of new franchise agreements with each of the, uh, each of the vendors. Um, we will attempt in those negotiations to get as much uh, additional benefit for the people of the city of New York as we can, but I, I would hesitate to commit uh, to show my hand in negotiation to commit to, to any particular goal in those negotiations. Thank you. But I share, I, I, we recognize uh, your statement that those um, facilities are important to your constituents and they will certainly play a very serious part in our negotiations. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, um, are companies that misrepresent their commitments to the city regarding local hiring and the delivery of service, the kind of companies that deserve to profit from the use of the city's properties? So I would say no. I think that, that, we, um, that the idea of any concealment to us or material misrepresentation to us would be one that we would view very gravely. Um. Thank you. I am now going to turn it over to Chair Salamanca for a few questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya. Um, thank you very much um, for, uh, for your statement. 
Uh, regarding the franchise agreements, can you uh, tell us when the next round of uh, franchise agreements are up for Spectrum, Verizon, and LTs? Uh, Th these franchise agreements are all coterminous, and they all end in 2020. All right. Uh, considering the issues we've talked about, and we'll talk about regarding Verizon and Spectrum, discrepancies and claims of false statements, agree, um, agreed upon provisions, how will that affect the next round of franchise negotiations? As uh, my colleague just said, any material misrepresentations or actions in violation of the franchise agreement will be taken extremely seriously during the course of those negotiations. What we, I, I want to make clear that we share the Council's goals and seek the most robust labor provisions possible, and we're opening, open to working with the Council to making them stronger over the process. The, the next two years will provide um, a number of opportunities for the public to be heard on the uh, renewal process. There will be hearings across the city, and we're hoping that those hearings and the whatever hearings are held on the uh, authorizing resolution will provide opportunities to further air these issues and bring to light whatever uh, actions against the public interest have been taken by the, our cable franchisees. Regarding Verizon, what is the status of the pending litigation regarding their fiber optic cable build out? Uh, yes, uh, Council Member, the case is at the New York State Supreme Court and is currently in uh, the discovery phase of the litigation. All right. Considering that Verizon believes that they satisfy the build out objectives and do it best to differ, are there any other similar differences or opinion in terms of conditions with other franchise agree agreements that this body should be aware of? Not specifically, council member, but I think that um, any time we audit uh, a franchisee as we're doing now, it's because we don't we think there's something that needs to be looked into. So I think uh, our audits are indicative of, any, of a disagreement. All right. which, div which division in it is tasked with ensuring that these franchise agreements are satisfied as per you know, the sign agreements? It's, uh, it's the division headed by uh, my colleague, Andy Manch Manchel, uh, the Franchise Administration. Di di uh, right. And how many staffers does this division have? In total, there are 25 people who work in the division, but they cover uh, mobile telecommunications, uh, the, w the new Wi-Fi kiosk, the Link NYC program, uh, as well as cable. And how many telecommunication franchise agreements does do it currently oversee the, the three we've been discussing just three there's only three Th there is a fourth provider who that does not have a franchise agreement that is grandfathered for, for certain technical federal regulatory reasons um, th they provide a similar service but don't have a franchise that company's called RCN if I could just follow up on your question, there are also um, separately from the cable franchises, eight, um, currently eight mobile telecom uh, franchisees. There is one franchisee for public communication structures, City Brave. So, so here, before this particular uh, body today, we're talking about three franchisees, but there are many more than that in our portfolio. All right, and just an off-topic question. How, when are the mobile franchise agreements up for renewal? So the mobile telecom franchise uh, agreements are up for renewal a year before the cable franchises, next year, 2019. Uh, and do it just issued a um, request for propo proposals um, on that uh, on that question, seeking uh, potential responders, uh, which is due July 18th of this year. We'll get responses back. All right. And then my last question, um, don't know if you'll be able to answer this, uh, is do we currently auditing any fr franchises? Which, any which franchise? Are you doing an audit on any of these uh other than, other than what you did for Charter, are you doing an audit on Verizon or on um, Altice? We, we have no current plans to audit any other franchisee, but that's subject to change at any time. Our, our audit function is pr principally complaint driven. So when we receive an issue of concern, um, we will dr attempt to uncover it. What, what is the, um, how do you get these complaints to want to initiate an audit? Uh, we receive complaints the way other city agencies do through the 311 system, by email, um, and also uh, through our partners in the council who forward to us 
concerns that their constituents might have. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Mrs. you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair you. Moya. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. I'd now like to turn it over to Chair Ku uh, for some questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, thank you for coming to testify. Um, I'm sorry I missed your testimony a little bit. I had to run across the street to vote. Uh, my question is, uh, how often does Stewart perform audits of the cable franchises? You do it uh, how often? So as, uh, as um and you just mentioned um, the, there's no regular cadence to audits. What we do with our audits is when we are made aware of an issue or a potential violation in the agreement, then we would look at that um, allegation and, and determine to commence the audit, which is what happened some time ago now with Verizon and is what happened, um, uh, and, and actually I should say with respect to the, to, to the two charter audits, one was initiated by our own team that saw something that, that they thought looked remiss, and the other one was initiated after evidence was brought to us. And how often does Stuart find the franchises to be in default and not in compliance with their franchise agreements? Is it the first time? Uh, mm. I, so there's no real uh, statistic on that point, uh, Chair. Um, but uh, you know, I will say that we, we take our auditing power very seriously at Do It, and so we don't initiate an audit lightly. And if, we're initiate, if we initiate an audit, it means we're serious and we're concerned about what we've been told which bore out in the case of, of the charter audit. Now, with the increase of popularity of internet and streaming services, how is Stuart calculating revenue from the cable franchises, especially when cable fees are often bundled uh, in packages? It's a very good question, Council Member. Uh, as I've stated before, we are limited in our uh, role to regulating only cable. So the, uh, and the cable franchise fees are based on 5% of the gross revenue from cable services. So in order to disaggregate the bundled cable services, we uh, allocate in, in our calculations a portion of the bundled fee that is equal to the percentage uh, allocable to cable charges uh, um, as opposed to the other things bundled in the cable. So if in, in the package, so let's say that there's a $100 monthly package and $33 goes to cable and $33 goes to broadband and $33 goes to uh, uh, and each, each individually would be $33, then we uh, allocate one-third of, of that revenue to the cable franchise. Thank you, Chairman Ku. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Lansman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So as has been discussed, Part of the franchise agreement is a labor provision which requires, among other things, um, that the uh, charter spectrum um, recognize the right to bargain collectively of its, of its workers and that the franchisees, franchisees shall not dominate, interfere with, participate in the management of or control of to give financial support to any union or association of its employees. Um, in your testimony, you say that our audit into charters compliance with labor-related provisions did not find the company in violation of the relevant requirements of the agreement. I want to understand the scope of do its inquiry into uh, charters compliance with this section of the franchise agreement. For example, does do it examine whether or not charter is negotiating in good faith? So to answer your question, council member, we do, and this was referenced in the audit report, um, we are not labor law investigators sort of independently. Um, what we do is we investigate uh, what the National Labor Relations Board um, has been hearing 
uh, and is investigating themselves. Um, and we rely in some respects on their jurisdiction and expertise to then f make a finding of a violation of the provision um, you cited. So with respect to an unfair labor practice, for example, we would look for activity at the, NLR at the NLRB, and if there was a finding adverse to, to any, any of the franchisees, that would be a basis to um, find a violation of the agreement. In the case of one particular instance with uh, charter, an administrative law judge did find them in violation of the labor laws, and we are waiting for some time now to hear uh, how that is resolved at the NLRB on appeal. So you say two different things. They may not be different. They, one may be part of the other. But you say you, you look, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I think, you say you, you, you look to what's going on at the NLRB, but it sounds like it's, it's actually more restrictive, that you are relying exclusively on the NLRB to make a determination one way or the other before do it will um, act to enforce this provision of the franchise agreement. Is that, is that do its position that, that you have essentially delegated or, or contracted out responsibility for enforcing this provision of the, the franchise agreement to the National Labor Relations Board? It is our view that this, is, this provision essentially tracks uh, the National Labor Relations Act federal law um, requirements uh, and that federal law sort of squeezes out localities from doing their own um, labor law enforcement above and beyond that. So I guess what I meant to say by scanning is that the, you know, the NLRB process can be somewhat opaque uh, and so we sort of actively are keeping an eye on that but I think the answer to your, the question as it was posed is yes. Well, that's, and, and we've had conversations, and I do appreciate Dewitt's responsiveness to my, my questions on these issues. Um, but that's, that's problematic. First, I, I, it seems to fly in the face of the plain language of, of the agreement. Right? If the franchise agreement intended for Dewitt's hands to be tied solely to determinations by the NLRB, it could easily have said that. It would have taken up a lot less words and fewer pages more trees saved, it would have simply said something to the effect of the franchisee will uh, be in compliance with the National Labor Relations Board or a violation or finding by the NLRB will be a violation of, of the agreement. But instead, the language went into considerable detail and, and some thought. You know, this, this, this phrase, the sentence, franchisee shall not dominate, interfere with, participate in the management or control of, or give financial support to any union or association of its employees. So I, I really question whether or not do it is fulfilling its responsibilities to interpret and, and enforce the franchise agreement. Now, are you telling me that it's your understanding that do it is in fact preempted from, from, from doing such an inquiry and conducting an investigation and issuing findings that are consistent with the franchise agreement because of the National Labor Relations Act or some telecommunications act? So two points, let me answer your... And, it, and if so, I'd, I'd love to see the legal authority for sure. that. So uh, to, to, to the question of preemption, I don't know that I can speak necessarily to, to do it specifically, but I do believe the case law is fairly settled about whether or not um, the localities have an independent right to enforce labor standards um, differently than the federal government would do it. Although you are right that these provisions sound distinct from federal uh, constraints, they do track very closely both in terms of the statute and in terms of case law. But if I may take your first point second, I guess, for me, um, you know, I would also say that these provisions go back a long ways and the authorizing resolution is a chance for you and us to be looking at all these provisions in terms of do we feel they say the right thing and I think we're open to uh, any um, suggestions you or others that the council have uh, about that. Um, these are not, these provisions predate us, you know, this, this administration by a long time and I think are drawn from the premise that indeed localities do have their hands tied uh, with respect to making independent judgments, judgments as, as to collective bargaining um, obligations. Well, so I say this with respect and, and collegiality. 
But my first suggestion would be for do it to enforce the terms of the franchise agreement that are written and that um, uh, clearly uh, cover uh, uh, the substance of, of several of the complaints that the union has made to the NLRB. The reality is the membership of the NLRB changes, its politics changes, and I don't think that we as New Yorkers really want to contract out to the extent that we're able to determination of whether or not uh, one of our franchisees is, is adhering to a labor provision in our contract to, to the whims of the NLRB. So that would be my, my first suggestion. And the union has provided significant detail, and I'm going to go over this with, with Charter when, they, when they're sitting in the, in the chair, um, that, would, that strongly suggests that they are engaging in grossly unfair labor practices. So let me ask you a question. Do you, do you think that a, um, a franchisee, in this case Charter, that is improperly engaging in a decertification campaign, that is violating the National Labor Relations Act by um, propping up a decertification campaign and purport, providing support to it. Do you think that that that, that would violate Section Article 17.1 of the, the the franchise agreement? Yes, I think that if it were substantiated, yes. I think that if I may, um, part of the the constraints that we face is a is a. Um, uh, a quality of, of both kind of expertise and sort of like the actual legal charge to do something. Um, but yes, I think uh, what I will tell tell you, council member, is that we, um, you know, we are open to reviewing any evidence we get on this point and would do so rigorously and have done so. Um, but I do think that there is a, an overlay of legal constraint here that um, uh, keeps us from doing as much as we'd want. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm... I have a couple more questions, but I, I'm going to provide you, I'm sure Local 3 has provided it to you already, but I'm going to provide you with the basis, the facts that, I'm, that are available to me, which indicate that the company uh, is engaged in one of the, the, the grossest abuses that a company can engage in, and that is interfering very directly and materially with the employee's right to choose their own, um, their own representatives. Uh, but let's move on. The, uh, forgive me if I, if I, if I missed the, the detail, but you made reference in your testimony to the audit. The audit found that Charter has been using an overly broad definition of what it means for a vendor to be located in New York City, a term that was not sufficiently well defined in the agreement. That's a very diplomatic way of putting it, and I, I credit whoever wrote this testimony if, if, it, if it was you, but if you haven't already, could you share with, with, with the, the, the committee exactly how they uh, redefined being in New York City? I think people will find it interesting and give them an insight into how this company conducts itself. Sure. I, our, and this was spelled out in part in our audit, and, and, and I'm happy to answer it here. Um, basically, their position is that a city vendor is a company that has any address of any kind in the five boroughs of the city of New York. And that address could include a place where they just store their equipment for their operations. Correct. And, that's, and, and this, in some respects, is where I think our audit was effective at unearthing, uh, unearthing key, key components of this inquiry, right? Because, yes, um, if there's a self-storage address, um, we don't think that, without any other information, tells you that it is a city vendor, right? It's just an address in, in one of the five boroughs. And, um, I, yeah. I, I could be a, a vendor, my law practice, let's say. I could be a, I could be a vendor of legal services if I, if I rented a, a, a P.O. box in, in Arizona or, or store, I store my, my, my uh, um, equipment, a computer in, in some, some storage shed in, in Tucson, then I would, be, I would be in Arizona. I'd be in Arizona business. Right. Yes. You know, though in your instance, if you have a law firm here, you could be a, a cable business. That's what, that would be all you need. Yeah. It's pretty absurd, isn't it? We, we disagreed with that entirely and gave them a whole new set of criteria to look at, um, and we'll be auditing their, their compliance with, with that. All right. Lastly, because I know my colleagues have questions, the process. Right. The purpose of the authorizing resolution is to lay out the framework of what the franchise agreements may contain. With that framework in place, the city must then undertake a number of assessments before negotiating the terms of the next franchise agreement. 
do you understand our authority as the council in, in giving the, um, the authorizing agreement to uh, include the ability to, for example, limit the eligibility of franchisees to those who have not had a history of either NLRB violations or well-founded NLRB complaints or some other metric of, of labor standards? I would, uh, the way I would articulate that is that if an adverse finding were made, a material adverse finding were made by the NLRB with respect to um, a, uh, a, a potential franchisee that may, may well be disqualifying. And if I could just add to that, Council Member, I mean, I, th I think that um, my colleague mentioned this, you know, we view the renewal process as an opportunity multiple sets of opportunities to review what's going on with these franchises, and I, I think the council should do the same. Right. Well, uh, I intend, for my part, just one little old council member here, um, to press for the council in its authorizing amendment or resolution uh, to be as specific and in detail as possible when it comes to the protecting the, um, the rights of the people who work at these companies to, to which we give these extraordinarily valuable uh, franchise agreements. All right, thanks very much. So we have Council Member uh, Reynoso, um, followed by uh, Public Advocate James and Council Member Holden and Council Member Yeager. Reynoso? Yeah. Oh, can I defer my time to Council Member I, Holden, I have, who has to yeah. go to a hearing? Yeah, we'll I'm switch places. Yeah, Thank, thanks so much, uh, Council Member. Um, you're, you're very, I don't know if you've gotten complaints um, about Ri uh, Verizon's um, marketing techniques, um, high pressure marketing. Um, uh, as a happy RCN customer, for many years. Um, I had Verizon for my phone service. Not a day went, went by that I didn't get two or three calls from Verizon, Verizon to try to get me to switch over to, to uh, Fios. My mom was also a, um, a Verizon uh, customer for phone only. So two or three calls a day, somebody ringing my bell. I said, I don't want Fios. What do I have to do to just get you to stop? I, I'm very happy with my cable service. They didn't stop. They set up uh, their tables in the streets, in residential communities to try to sell it. They set up tents. Two or three calls continue today. I had the old copper service on my phone. They stopped maintaining it. That means I get outages every few months, two or three times. Um, Last, two months ago, my mom, which I tell, she's 94 years old, she, she doesn't answer the telemarketers. She won't answer the phone. I tell her, don't, just hang up on them. She had Verizon copper service. She kept hanging up on them. What they did, Verizon cut off her phone service. I didn't know for several weeks that she cut, because she lives in the same house. They cut off her, her phone service because she didn't agree to Fios. Now, two blocks away, you can't, in my neighborhood, you can't get files. But in my house, I was unfortunate. I can get files, but I didn't want it. And we were harassed, cut off. And by the way, if you're cut off from your copper service, and they actually told me that they don't actually maintain the copper wire anymore. So if you, you can have outages, they'll take sometimes a month to respond. And many seniors have that service from the old days. So. I think, did you get any complaints on this? Uh, did you hear anything like this? Go ahead, take it on. We, we have not received complaints like that. We are, what we are being told by Verizon with respect to the specific question that you raise is that they are converting their entire system from copper wire to fiber optic cable into the home. Um, and, and they're rolling that out. I know they've done it in my apartment. Yeah, basically. but we, we didn't receive any letters from fire. The only thing they do is call you. And again, 
a lot of people don't want to pick up. A lot of people, that, you know, so I, this is a problem, I think, that if you guys can look into this. I, I have begun a dialogue, right. particularly with Verizon, in the last two weeks with respect to customer service. Um, we had a, as, as the diplomats call it, a full and frank discussion of the issues with respect to uh, customer service, and we are one of my, I've been at Do It for four months, and one of my particular pieces of agenda is to improve customer service from all the providers to every customer. Yeah, and just if you, when you sit down with them, tell them I wouldn't go to files because of the customer service that I experienced over the years. It, Thanks it, so much. Council member, it would be my great pleasure. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the, the public advocate. Thank you. So, um, the stories that the council member just described with regards to copper service, it's also um, has happened in my former district in uh, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, and Crown Heights. And although I am not the council member as present, council member Lori Cumbo uh, currently serves us. As I walk in my neighborhood, um, I hear the same, particularly from seniors. And as I visit them in, in um, senior centers, they tell me um, that they usually hang up um, from these marketeers and uh, now they do not have phone service. Um, and so it's a problem. And so I'm really shocked that you have not received any complaints because if it's happening in Queens and it's happening in Brooklyn, um, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere. And so my question to you are, um, if um, all the issues that we've described, age discrimination, um, uh, failure to respect labor standards, speed, all of these complaints, um, what are the default provisions under the franchise agreement? Because what I'm hearing is the following, that the uh, resolution that will be negotiated by this city council in the coming months, um, that the previous um, authorizing resolution was done way before this administration and there's not much we can do, or two, um, that were preempted by federal law and or case law, and there's not much we can do. So is it, your, is it basically your position that you're sort of limited and um, precedent, it basically ties your hand and uh, the previous administration that, that negotiated this franchise agreement um, left a lot to be desired and, there's, and we're sort of limited in our response. So uh, to answer your question, public advocate, I think we do, we do feel, feel we are limited, um, but we do also think that with what we have, we're pushing as hard as we can, um, and we'll continue to do so. But with that also said, as I mentioned earlier, um, we view this renewal process as an opportunity for we and, and your office and the council to look across the board at our franchise portfolio and uh, see if there are ways to, to improve. But um, in regards to, uh, I think, the failure to, pour, to define what it means to be located in New York City, you put forth, you detailed uh, new criteria and revised standards. If you did it in the case of uh, a poorly drafted agreement, um, why can you not put in place revised standards and detailed criteria in the area of labor relations, discrimination, um, local business uh, uh, practices, and, and lastly, speed. I think that I think that we should look into all those things, and I think that uh, the city vendor definition example is one where we clearly felt, as we conducted our audit, that um, city the word city vendor wasn't enough, and that we wanted we thought there were logical criteria that they should be using and that it's something that we certainly should look at for future franchise agreements. Do you believe that you have the power currently to close these loopholes with respect to those four issues that I just outlined? Currently? Not, not that I'm aware of. I think it would be about, well, first of all, I should step back. Um, for every loophole you've described, if, if, a, if something comes in, I mean, we do take our audit power seriously and we'll exercise an audit for, on the provisions we have. Um, I'm not aware of any power we have now to sort of revise those currently, um, but I do think the franchise renewal process is the perfect opportunity to look at our franchise agreements and say, this franchise agreement could be better and we're gonna make it better. 
but I guess I'm sort of confused. You were able to issue revised standards with respect to a poorly defined term. And so with the other issues that I just outlined, why can you not issue revised standards with respect to labor relations, discrimination, speed, and local um, um, hiring? Uh, I'm sorry, I understand your question now. Yeah, so with respect to city vendor, there was a particular vagueness in the language. With respect to um, discrimination laws and, and, uh, and labor laws, that is the area probably more so than with um, the requirement that they utilize city vendors where, where we do think state and federal law ties our hands more than the other ones. Um, but I think that that precise legal question is the one that's sort of on the table right now to look at and think about. If in fact we, you determine that um, Charter has defaulted in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular area. What can you do um, at that point? Can you require, can you demand specific performance? So the, the, all of this is gonna be sketched out in precision in the, in the franchise agreement. Uh, to answer your question, uh, public advocate, it, it, will, it will depend upon the nature of the default. There are two different types of defaults in the franchise agreement. Uh, there's a revocation default, which is sort of enumerated in detail. A what kind of default, I'm a, sorry? A revocation default. Revocation. Uh, and then the other default, which doesn't have a name. Um, uh, these particular uh, alleged violations we've been discussing here mostly fall in the camp of that other default. Um, and so what you'll, you're gonna do if you find a default, you'll take the actions that are uh, um, spelled out in the franchise agreement and then that will be on the record of the company when the company is reviewed at, at renewal time. So let me just recap. So uh, until such time as the NLRB determines that in fact there's a default, you're sort of limited in your power Two, you look forward to negotiating um, with this city council on um, a upcoming resolution. Um, and th three, the areas that I outlined, unfortunately there is, you cannot revise the language to ensure compliance. Is that pretty much? I think that's pretty much That's it. That's, okay, so our hands are tied in other words. Can you explain what is it, it, um, entailed in the proof of performance test? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar uh, with that. Okay, let me go on to, to another question. Has the city requested competitive service and technology reports of uh, franchisees? You know, I don't believe we have. Okay. I believe the answer to that is no. Okay. And then my last question is in regards to Verizon, and that is there's a pending lawsuit um, against Verizon with regards to uh, Verizon defaulting on its obligations to build out. As someone who is a strong propo proponent and continues to be, joining with other citywide advocates uh, with regards to um, helping to bridge the digital divide and create more opportunities for underserved communities in the city of New York, as um, I understand that the case is currently pending against Verizon. Um, besides um, seeking specific performance, are there any other remedies that you are seeking at this point in time in court? That is the key remedy. That's the key, okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, turn it over to Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I wanna work off of the uh, um, Public Advocate's questions. Um, in the franchise agreement, it seems like language is an issue here. Um, so I wanna talk about uh, you believe that a modification to the language related to city contractors needs to happen for you to properly enforce or, or regulate, I guess, uh, charters, charters interpretation of what it is to be a city contractor? That would be something we need more, more universally, but with respect to that particular issue in charter, we believe that via what we've done with the audit, we've already put them on notice that we expect them to do that. So um, the broader question would be a broader change, but we believe we've told them how we view that agreement language and told them to comply with how, how we've defined okay. it. So in cases where it is vague, like languages like this are vague or a franchisee chose to see it vaguely uh, and you modify it, do they have a time to rectify or a time to, to fix their, their problem or is it you gotta get rid of every single contractor that already doesn't comply with this new language that we've chosen, or because there's this, what I would consider like a reinterpretation or re-clarification, do they get an opportunity to 
rectify or, or fix the, the, con the, the conditions? So it's a combination, actually, of the two. I think we, we told them that in terms of the definition, the sort of how they should interpret what it means, we want that to be immediate, right? We've now told you so. Going forward immediately, use that interpretation. In terms of uh, the feasibility of using such contractors under that de definition, that would be a bit more rolling, mm -hmm. and that's what we plan on investigating with the, with the second audit. All right, so I think, I think that that's fair. What you're saying is uh, moving forward, they have to comply with your, the, the new re-established re concept re related to city contracts, um, and then you're going to work on modifying every, single, every other part of it so they can get into compliance the way you see it. But unfortunately, because the language was written the way it was in the franchise agreement, um, would you consider charter at fault is, I guess, what I'm asking? In that case, or do you see the need? Did you see the need to clarify? I think that that in this particular instance, you know, reasonable people can disagree. I think that we um, just were not persuaded by, and 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 mm -hmm. Charter can speak to their interpretation. We we were just not persuaded by their view of what it meant to be located in the city of New York. Okay, so reasonable people reasonable people could have disagreed there, and I think you've come to a a pretty good resolution. By the way, I think it's. You know, when an audit happens and we see a problem and it gets addressed by do it, um, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But what, I, what I'm having huge issues with is that we have to wait to 2020, really, to, to really modify and strengthen these franchise agreements to be able to hold um, franchisees accountable. Um, uh, what, what I'm seeing here is not, you know, the law is what you can get away with. Right, uh, a good friend of mine, Marty Needleman, says that constantly every time I'm with him. The law is what you can get away with. And I, I believe that we did ourselves a disservice by putting forth a weak franchise agreement that made it so a lot of these things are vague and muddy and gray. Um, and it allowed for uh, any franchisee to, to move about in those, in those murky waters. So I'm just seeing myself here as a, a proponent to needing to wait to 2020 to really figure out a way to be helpful, um, given what you consider state and federal, you know, uh, you know, handcuffs, right, and also a, a weak franchise agreement. I think what I would say to that council member, it, it, yes, to re with respect to revisions of the agreement, there feels like a long window. But I will say, as we've said earlier, that we don't always get the information as to particular violations, and so. If there's something brought to our attention, whatever it may be, it's something we look at seriously and would, would audit it and sort of carry out whatever remedies we have. Um. Yeah. No, it's just I see mostly claims. Um, you know, we know the NLRB is investigating as well. But outright, right now, it seems like we need, a, we need to do more on that franchise agreement. Um, and I think what we're having here in this conversation it's, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation to have, I think, because of the weak agreements and how we're preempted by state and federal, federal law. Um, I just think this is a very hard hearing to have um, to try to get to a conclusion, I guess. I agree with that. But um, I appreciate your time, and thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I've been asked by my colleagues to correct the record, if, 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 uh, if you'd be kind enough to allow me to do that. Sure. Yep. Um, I, I misunderstood a question that the uh, public advocate asked me, and I'd like to read into the record uh, an answer. This is about um, the monitoring the, the quality of the service that's provided. Uh, we do, uh, ha we have performed voluntary internet test speeds during our biennial, biennial proof of performance testing of the cable system for each cable franchise. The, these tests are voluntary because we don't uh, regulate broadband service. But the ones that we have performed over the last two years have re yielded results showing that the average internet speeds were above the 300 um, Mbps range uh, at all charter test points. Um, she also asked about um, proof of performance testing, and that pertains only to cable and video services. But we'd be happy to provide further information about the cable system proof of performance tests uh, at your request. Thank you for allowing me to correct the record, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I want to turn it over to Council Member. Uh, oh, first, let me acknowledge Council Member Miller, Council Member Constantinides, and Council Member Torres. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Council Member uh, Yeager. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, uh, in the interest of time and allowing my colleagues to uh, proceed, and I know there are a lot of people here who want to testify, I'm just going to be very brief. Um, my first question is uh, with regard to FIOS and whether or not it's, uh, quote, available at every address. I understand this is currently the subject of litigation, but my question is, do the cable companies in their franchises have that same obligation uh, specifically to pass all households in the city? They, they do have an obligation like that, although it's, it's, the obligation is worded, I believe, slightly different. The other, the other cable companies, other than Verizon, I, I believe, have a slightly different wording, but they do have a similar obligation. That's right. Okay, so does that mean that every address in the city, with forgetting about the question of whether or not it can get Fios, is currently able to get cable? Within the franchise area, for each franchise, each residential address should be passed, and yes. If a cable company says we don't serve a building, does, is that a violation of the franchise agreement? If it's within their area and it's a residential building, they're required to have made it available. And um, the only thing that would, I, I, I hope I'm not misstating this uh, council member, I think the only thing that would impede them would be a refusal of the building itself to allow them to come in and hook it up. But other than that, they should have that option. Got it, okay. Um, if the, uh, uh, Chair Moya earlier asked the question regarding 24-hour uh, news channels, I wanna be a little more specific. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, Fios currently does not offer New York One. New York One is the Bible of the, our city government, um, uh, or at least a mega church of our city government. And uh, as I understand that this, the debate is, uh, seems to be that Verizon and Charter can't seem to come to terms. As you know, LT slash Cablevision uh, does have an agreement to carry New York One on their wires. Um, but Verizon, for some reason, has never been able to come to an agreement, and I don't know who's at fault. Do you know who's at fault for that? I don't. I will say I'm a Verizon Fios customer and don't get New York One and find it extremely frustrating, so I will, I will look into that for you. Okay. Well, let's, let's figure that out, because otherwise we shouldn't even bother coming here. Um, this is just a greater question about the, what happens at the end of days. Um, if the franchises are not re-awarded come 2020 and thereabouts or whenever they're supposed to happen, who owns the infrastructure that's currently installed and what happens to it? You're speaking about the cable infrastructure? Cable infrastructure or the Fios infrastructure? E e each of the cable companies, each franchisee owns its own infrastructure. So let's say, you know, the uh, franchise uh, board, the council, etc., all the great people who make these decisions say, you know what, uh, Altice, you've been bad, and Charter, you've been bad, Fios, Verizon, you've all been bad, we're not going to award you the, the franchise, we're going to give it to somebody else. What happens? I would, uh, with either a revocation or a refusal to renew, the bottom line is the situation would be very protracted and disruptive. It's a rare occurrence and it would be hard to predict what would happen. There would surely be lawsuits and service disruptions to hundreds of thousands of customers. Uh, any new entrant into the market would have to purchase the cable infrastructure of the incumbent. And I'm sure the negotiation over what that price might be would be protracted. Now, Assistant Commissioner, you are, seem to have been ready for that question. I, I've given it a lot of thought. We didn't, we didn't coordinate this in advance, though. Um, so. I don't, want to, I don't want to belittle this because this is a very important topic. And, and by the way, I, the, the story that Councilmember Holden told before he left, uh, I had the same exact story. Verizon worker told me that they just don't monitor, they don't care about their copper anymore. This was a number of years ago, not yesterday. And they said, we're not maintaining it anymore because the company is trying to get people to go to Fios. Um, I had a situation where every time it drizzled for, drizzled for more than three minutes, my phone service would go out. I ultimately filed a complaint with the Public Service Commission, got a refund, and they came out, and they had to actually replace the copper, but they were not doing it, and they said that that's their position. I'm actually a little surprised that you hadn't heard that, but that's not your fault. That's on us for not telling you. Um, uh, but with regard to I that- I congratulate you on your success, Council Member. Uh, well, we're, we're going to fix that. We're going to make sure you get all those questions. <laughs> but I will share with you the letters that uh, I went back and forth with the Public Service Commission a number of years ago about it. Um, uh, with regard to the question that I just had, and I, again, don't want to belittle the topic, but are we a little bit spinning our wheels because ultimately we're not going to do a, do a thing that's going to deny people uh, access to their cable and their Fios, et cetera, and uh, if what you're saying is that a, a denial of a franchise would ultimately kind of shut down the system, you seem to be saying that. I don't want to put words uh, in your mouth. Uh, we take some 
no small pride in our capacity as franchise administrators uh, for the city. Our goal is to attempt to obtain the best possible technology services for the people of the city of New York, particularly those who are otherwise underserved. And within the, the very complex net or framework of federal and state regulations that are out there, we try to push the envelope as hard as we can to get as much for the people of the city of New York as we can. And we will, through the renewal process, attempt to once again do that, to get as much as we possibly can, to push the envelope as hard as we can to get the best possible service. Okay, but I want to be clear, though, that if the city does this decide that these franchises should not be awarded because these uh, companies are bad actors and are not deserving of, the, as Councilman Lansman uh, referred to it as, uh, this extraordinary uh, 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 thing that we're giving over when we make an agreement uh, and all we get back is 5%. But that's something that's in our power and we wouldn't be disrupting the city. I, I mean, it's I, not, I, I, I who has the cards here? It is, we, we have some cards. Okay. I, I, I would not want to tip my hand in advance of a negotiation that we're going to have with these companies, but um, with particular respect to, to Charter, we've uh, recognized what their uh, business strategy has been since they acquired the Time Warner franchise, and we will do the maximum in order to make sure that they're a good corporate citizen. Okay, well, uh, I would like very much to get New York One on file, so see if you can get to Duly noted. Me too. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Torres for, in the interest of time, foregoing his questions uh, as we need to continue to proceed with this hearing. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, for uh, attending and coming in here to testify. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also want to recognize uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Levin. Uh, I would now like to call up uh, the borough president, uh, Melinda Katz, to come up and testify. Oh. It's all homely. We provided it. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I do want to uh, acknowledge you, Mr. Chairman. As a Queens legislator, I thank you for the work you do, and Councilman Koo and Holden, and of course, Councilman Lanceman and Miller uh, and Constantinidis. We appreciate the work you do in the Borough of Queens. Um, we thank you, Councilman um, Moya and uh, Councilman Koo and members of the committee and subcommittee for holding this important oversight hearing on the city's cable franchises. As you know, Mr. Chairman, in the Borough of Queens, the cable franchise is currently held by charter and it's set to expire in July of 2020. As the city now begins to revisit this franchise, not only in Queens, but also Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, it is crucial for us to ensure that the next cable franchise agreement rectifies the problems we hear about today and as a side note, as you know, the borough presidents have a vote on the FCRC, and so does the public advocate uh, who just uh, stepped out, but we heard her testimony as well. To that end, I appreciate the testimony provided by Do It. My office has reviewed their audit and when it, pub when it was published earlier this year, and it alleges the charter potentially violated the terms of the current franchise agreement, and that charter not only ignored its requirement to contract with New York City vendors, but also had been adjudicated to have violated provisions of the NLRA. And I just as a, also a side note, you know, what Councilman Lansman said, I think, really needs to be reviewed. We don't understand why it only could be the NLRB to determine that there was a violation of negotiating in good faith. I think the Councilman is right on the nose, which is that a violation is a violation. And when the renewal comes up in 2020, the city will opine on whether um, the good faith has happened or not in its negotiations. I think that that is the right way to go forward. I hope the Charter will voluntarily take the corrective steps recommended by Do It, but their initial written response tempers that hope. In any event, my office looks forward to reviewing the subsequent audit and expects Do It will issue a default if appropriate. 
As a member of the FCRC, it's my responsibility to review proposed Queens-based franchise agreements, and a default against an applicant would certainly inform my decision. Now, I want it to be noted that I testify today not only as the Queensborough President, but also as the former chair of the City Council's Land Use Committee, having had oversight of many of the city's most important franchises, and also of note that I was the uh, prime sponsor of the authorizing agreement while I was the City Council's land chair and negotiated uh, with the agreement on uh, Time Warner at the, I guess it was Spectrum, no, Time Warner at the time, uh, Fios and the other um, organizations that provide service. Ultimately, we need to make sure that the franchises are beneficial and equitable to my borough's residents. It's become clear the Charter has not held up to its end of the bargain. First, Charter's treatment of its unionized employees has been outrageous. As you know, 1,800 Charter workers have been on strike for over a year, still waiting a fair deal to be offered. These hardworking men and women, members of Local 3, merely want to maintain the defined benefit pension and health plans into which they've already paid. Charters refuse to budge so far. We are hoping that they will return to the table to work with our local unions. Queens has remained a stable enclave for the middle class due to the union's efforts to secure well-paying jobs and solid benefits for their members. Second, I've been extremely dissatisfied with many of the Charter's responses to service outages in Queens. In the most egregious example, an outage exactly one year ago left approximately 60,000 Queens residents and businesses without internet, phone, and cable service for hours. Not only was this a major disruption for those affected, but also the problem of communication happened, whereas we didn't re realize it for at least 12 hours. So our office was getting complaints, and then all of a sudden the second hour we were getting complaints, the third hour, the fourth hour, and it was really 12 hours later after a phone call that you know, we got a response to the constituents. And the response was information, but in order to make up for the hours of delay of internet, or the, I don't know how long it took, a day, two days, um, we were offered only a few dollars on every bill to make up for it. I will also note that in Queens, many of our seniors rely on their house phone, which was affected by every single outage, and that is a problem. Moving forward, the city needs to make clear that any company to which a valuable franchise is granted must meet certain expectations. We expect that the company will offer its workers fair wages and reasonable benefits, as well as respect the rights to organize. We expect that the company will communicate with its customers in a timely fashion when its service fails and provides them with reasonable reimbursement, reasonable reimbursement. And we expect that the company will abide by the terms of the franchise agreement and that any violation will jeopardize its ability to conduct future business in this great city of New York. I thank you very much for your time, Mr. Chair. I know that you will find many issues here today in the testimonies, and we look forward to uh, an agreement that will hopefully come before the 2020 vote on the franchise, but also for better service in the, in the Borough of Queens. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Borough President. Thank you for, for coming here to testify and hailing from the greatest borough in the city of New York. I <laughs> uh, want to thank you again for all that you do uh, for all of us. Thank you. It's also great to be back in this room, I must tell you. <laughs> to have you. And we're proud of you. Thank you. No questions? All right. We appreciate the time and effort that it's going to take today. We know it's going to be a long day, and we look forward to the outcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Borough President. Okay, we are now going to move to the next panel. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Camille Joseph from Spectrum, John Fogarty, and Rodney Capel. <coughs> So, so if you can, you, you can fill out, uh, we'll yeah.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon, actually. Uh, good afternoon. Just please state your name. Camille Joseph Goldman. Rodney Capel. John Fogarty. Thank you. you can start your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Moya and Ku and members of the committees. My name is Camille Joseph Goldman. I am Charter's Vice President for Government Affairs in Northeast Region, which includes Charter service areas throughout New York City and New York State. Thank you for the opportunity to, be, to appear before your committee today to discuss Charter's cable service in New York City and the franchise renewal process recently initiated by DOIT. As you know, Charter has several franchises with New York City covering Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and portions of Brooklyn. The company, through its predecessor, has offered cable service in the city for decades, and we have always seen I'm ourselves- I'm sorry, I just wanted to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but did you submit testimony for um, the panel? We're gonna be submitting um, testimony for the record after. Thank you. We were told we had like 24 hours, I believe, or till Thursday, apologies. Um, my apologies. So the company through its predecessor has offered cable service in the city for decades, and we have always seen ourselves as your partners in bringing the best, most advanced, and highest quality of services to your constituents and to our customers. Since acquiring Time Warner Cable two years ago, in May of 2016, Charter has made significant investments in its network, which has enabled us to, de to deliver better products and services, including faster broadband speeds than before the merger. We have insourced more customer service functions, prepared our network and operations for upcoming launches of high-value competitive mobile wireless services, introduced a new low-cost, high-speed broadband service to low-income customers, and continue to improve the quality and mix of our cable television offerings, including through investments in hyperlocal, 24-hour news and information networks from Spectrum News, New York One, and Noticias. A few of the national highlights of the company's achievements and investments since completing the merger include the addition of more than 1.8 million new customers, the expansion of our network, including here in New York City, to provide the capability to serve more than 1.6 million new homes and businesses, and the creation of 7,000 new jobs. As a result of these and other successes, Charter remains the fastest growing cable company in the country. Charter offers our superior products and services to bring greater value to our customers' cable television experience. Last year, Charter completed the rollout of spectrum pricing and packaging in New York City, offering customers simple, robust, high-value, and uniformly priced services under our spectrum broadband. Today, spectrum pricing and packaging defines the majority of our customer relationships. We offer some of the most robust programming options, over 200 HD channels, one of the largest video on demand libraries with more than 10,000 titles, and one of the most technologically advanced video service apps platforms in the industry on Spectrum App. With over 170 live television channels, 60 of the Spectrum app channels are available on the go, allowing customers to take their Spectrum television services outside the home. We have the most free HD channels available anywhere, and the Spectrum Mi Plan Latino offers 130 channels, including more than 75 channels in Spanish. Our international plans and a la carte offerings provide programming choices from across the world. Innovating to meet the evolving needs of our customers is one of our most important priorities here at Charter. Earlier this month, Apple announced at its Worldwide Developers Conference that later this year, Charter customers will be able to watch hundreds of live TV channels, as well as tens of thousands of on-demand shows and movies using our innovative Spectrum TV app on Apple TV 4K, as they already do on iPhones and iPads and a growing number of other devices. Our partnership with Apple is an exciting new example of Charter's dedication to offering our customers the flexibility to access content when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. Although broadband and other non-cable services are not subject of this hearing today, as they are not specifically regulated by the city under the cable franchise, let me say a few words about them as well. Charter is one of the nation's leading high-speed internet broadband providers. At the end of 2017, Charter made New York City one of its first markets where we offer customers one gig internet connection with download speeds of up to 940 megabits per second. 
Our standard residential broadband service provides download speeds of 200 megabits per second in New York City, and we offer these services without data caps, usage-based pricing, early termination, or modem fees. Just last Friday, we launched Spectrum Business Internet Gig in the city, serving small and medium-sized businesses and offering the same one gig internet connection with download speeds of up to 900 megabit, 940 megabits per second. Residential and small businesses can now get these services at a fraction of the cost required to buy these speeds from other providers in the past if they were even available. And we deliver it over our advanced hybrid fiber optic cable network Charter continues to demonstrate that as demand for bandwidth and capacity grows, the company's network is best positioned to respond to those needs and meet those demands. The city recently put out a plan to ensure ubiquitous one gigabit service availability throughout the city by 2025. I am pleased to report to you that Charter has already made that happen in 2018. Supporting the state-of-the-art network and providing these advanced products and services to customers here in New York City require a strong, well-trained, and dedicated workforce. Charter has more than 95,000 employees nationwide, and we employ more than 11,000 people in New York State alone, including thousands of people in New York City. Our employees are dedicated, highly trained, and professional. They live in New York, they work in New York, and they care about the millions of customers who live and work here, too. Having spent all my life right here in New York, I can say unequivocally that this is the greatest city in the world. It deserves the best products, delivered by the best service in the world, too. And I am proud that here at Charter, we strive to deliver that for customers every single day. Our employees are offered competitive wages, excellent benefits, job training, and career progression opportunities for all. Recently, the company announced that across its entire 41-state footprint, all of our employees will receive a $15 an hour minimum wage by the end of the year. The majority of our employees are call center representatives, field technicians, and staff personnel at Spectrum stores. They interact with thousands of people every day and are the face of charter to our customers. These employees are the key ingredient to helping us deliver our core business objective, which is providing superior products with great customer service. Our management require, recognizes that a $15 an hour minimum wage for those valued workers builds on our nationwide commitment to hire over 20,000 employees by 2020 and will enable us to better attract, train, and retain highly skilled, diverse workers we want and need to solve our customers' issues or install cable and broadband service in their homes. Our employees are eligible for the company's generous benefit programs. This includes comprehensive health coverage, tuition, reimburse, tuition reimbursement assistance, strong vacation, sick, and leave policy, and a generous 401k retirement program that matches employee contributions dollar for dollar up to 6% of that individual's compensation. Charter is also working hard to attract and retain a diverse workforce. We are proud of the Spectrum Broadband Technician Apprenticeship Program, a national program we developed to create a pipeline for veterans to join charter workforce after completing their military service. Qualified veterans can secure GI Bill benefits by completing the program's classroom curriculum and on-the-job training, putting them in a position to possibly earn tax-free money in addition to their charter paycheck. Veterans bring a mission-oriented mindset that helps Charter across all lines of business at all levels of the company, including our executive team. We recognize and value the skills these individuals develop during military service, and our goal is to help them build on their talents and translate them to a meaningful and valuable career with us. Our program was recently certified by the Department of Labor, allowing us to expand this initiative across our service areas, including right here in New York. Today, about 12% of our employees come from the military ranks, and we, have commit, we are committed to undertake an effort to grow that by 5% by 2020. Spectrum customers will see even better service from us as a result of the highly, high quality employees we can attract through apprenticeship programs like the one we offer our broadband technicians. 
Ethnic diversity is also an important tenet of our commitment to a strong workforce. At Charter, our employees are local and representative of the customers and communities we serve. In New York, almost 45% of Charter's workforce represents ethnic minorities, led by African Americans and Hispanic or Latinos at 22 and 15% respectfully. Moreover, since closing our transaction, we have made a concerted effort to enhance the company's focus on diversity and inclusion. The hiring of Charter's first Chief Diversity Officer and the establishment of an External Diversity and Inclusion Council exemplify this commitment. The council is made up of highly accomplished leaders with deep knowledge and experience in creating more opportunities for people of color. Its members include famed activist and civil rights leader, the Reverend Al Sharpton, and Mark Moriel, the president and CEO of the National Urban League, who serves as the council's chair. Representatives from other organizations with deep roots in New York City and strong ties to your communities that you serve, including high-level executives associated with LULAC, Unidos US, and the Hispanic Federation. The Council provides strategic advice to all facets of Charter's operations regarding diversity and inclusion efforts, including in the delivery of our services, where we are an industry leader providing ethnically diverse programming. We submitted letters today from some of those members of our Diversity Council, illustrating the value Charter brings to the community. All of these efforts are in service to our customers. At Charter, the mission is to focus on the consumer and bring innovative, customer-friendly service at a reasonable price. This formula has worked, and the feedback from our customers since the merger has been very positive. Speaking of our customers, Charter maintains very friendly customer service policies. Service appointments are scheduled during one-hour windows for the convenience of our customers, a third of which are in the evenings and weekends to accommodate the customers we serve here in New York. We maintain convenient neighborhood locations for customers to pay bills, return equipment, and transact other business. Charter recently opened a new store at the George Washington Bridge Terminal in Washington Heights and has been upgrading and improving our customer walk-in centers and locations across the city. In total, we have 12 stores open, and the retail organization is comprised of hundreds of employees across those stores. We also have plans to open many more stores over the next few years, which will significantly increase the number of employees in this region. Additionally, we have opened more than 28 technology centers, or learning labs, offering free video and broadband service and equipping them with software, televisions, computers, printers, smart boards, and laptops. We have brought free Wi-Fi services to our customers in the city parks. We pay hundreds of millions of dollars in franchise fee payments to the city, provide free channels for public, educational, and government use, and spend tens of millions in capital investment for the city's nonprofit PEG partners, MNN, BRIC, QPTV, and Staten Island Access. Finally, unique Charter's unique philanthropic program, Spectrum Housing Assist, helps ensure that more Americans live in safe and healthy homes and has set a goal of improving 25,000 homes in our service area by 2020. Working with our non-for-profit partner, we're building together. We have improved thousands of homes, contributed thousands of volunteer hours from Charter employees, provided millions of dollars in broadcast time to support the initiative, and conducted rebuild events around the city to support the program's objectives. We contribute culturally to the fabric of New York City as well. In the past year alone, we have held over 160 events and a multitude of engagements across the city, including partnerships with groups like the National Action Network's panel on their Digital Divide Initiative, the Personal Democracies Forums, Technical Skills Training for New York City Council staff, multiple computer distribution and digital education events with Power My Learning, and groups around the city like Woodside on the Move and the Dominican Women's Development Center. We also recently participated in the All STEM Tech Career Fair, encouraging and supporting the next generation of Latino youth in pursuing challenging and rewarding STEM, STEM careers, as well as sponsoring the New York Urban League Summer STEAM program. We are proud of our record and our work with the communities of the city and appreciate sharing the resources of the company to improve the lives of our customers and our constituents. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So, so um, before we get into questions, I just want to ask the council to swear the panel in. Please, ra please raise your right hand. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Just a couple of questions. Um, same question I posed to do it. Uh, Article 7 of the Spectrum Franchise Agreement uh, provides that Spectrum shall offer customers valuable and attractive competitive options in the terms of quality, scope, and technical sophistication of the services that it provides. What constitutes a competitive option uh, in a market where cable services are provided a monopoly? Sure, so we believe it Or at we, best a uh, duopoly. Yeah. Yeah. So we believe, and we've reported routinely to do it, that we offer not just competitive packaging, but the very best service for our customers, whether it's increasing um, the internet speeds right here in the city. As I said in my testimony, just this year we will, we will kind of um, complete our one gigabit expansion right here in New York City. We've also made significant increases to the quality of cable services from equipment to the types of options that any um, New York City resident can obtain. Um, so we believe we are, you know, we're an industry leader. We're kind of, um, um, we continue to grow as a technology incubator and grow our business and grow our options, but at, at here in New York City, we're offering the very best packages, the very best options to our customers. And what television services and technologies is Spectrum offering customers that are at, at, at least as sophisticated, if not more sophisticated, than the television technologies and services offered by Verizon and Altice? So could you repeat the, the beginning? I yeah, apologize, sure. I didn't hear you. What television services and technology is Spectrum offering customers that are at least as sophisticated, if not more sophisticated, than the television technologies and services that are offered by Verizon and Altice. Sure, and one thing I also want to, in my, when I, we talked about, you, you mentioned like a duopoly, I also want to mention that our customers, in addition to the franchise options in their area, can also kind of participate in satellite options as well. So we don't take for granted that our customers have several options. We do strive to offer them the very best. As far as what we offer, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, just this year alone, we mentioned a special partnership with Apple in which our customers will have a right around a wide array of different channel options and offerings. Um, we also, given uh, our sensitivity to cultural competence, we offer a, a wide array of um, channels that reflect the local, the local needs right here in New York City. There are uh, several multicultural programming options, high definition options, tens of thousands of title options through our cable services that we, quite frankly, think are not only competitive, but leading in the space amongst our competitors. Uh, in your testimony, you talked about the 200 megabyte, megabytes uh, that is now actually offered, you said, to uh, all of its customers. Can the customer actually benefit? Can, can the customer actually get the benefits of the 200 megabytes? Absolutely. And, you know, while I know that the, fran the cable franchise agreement doesn't extend to in in uh, our internet, um, provisions. Um, if any customer has any question about anything that we're offering, they should feel free to contact our company. We'll follow up accordingly. So, going with that, the Attorney General sued you, sued Spectrum, uh, for not being able to provide adequate services. In that lawsuit, how is it possible then that you are telling us here that you can provide the 200 megabytes to all of its customers when sure. there's an actual lawsuit? That's, I mean, first and foremost, that's ongoing litigation, so I can't speak too deeply into it. What I can say is that litigation commenced in 2013 um, before our merger, and so why we will aggressively and vehemently defend the actions of our predecessor, rest assured that since the merger, Charter Communications has invested significantly in expansions for customer and customer, customer quality assurance. So on both uh, fronts, we don't believe um, that we are in fault. The PSC recently fined Spectrum uh, $2 million uh, because it failed to meet its statewide network build out and commitments. Uh, you responded that the conditions you accepted in connection with your acquisition of Time Warner are not valid because the federal law regulates the cable uh, television industry. So my question is, do you believe that the PSC merger conditions were unforeseeable when you accepted them? 
I, well, first and foremost, let me just say that the, I think you're referencing the order to show cause. We've publicly filed a response to those allegations. Um, we, uh, we don't believe and don't agree with what the PSC is alleging. When we took on the merger deal here in New York City, we knew very well, and New York State, rather, we knew very well what, what our company was getting into. We looked forward to the uh, expansion provisions as highlighted by the merger order. We believe that what's being cited by the PSC um, it, we don't. We simply don't agree with it, and so we are. We've responded to. We publicly filed our responses to all the allegations, and we have not heard of any immediate next steps as of yet. Okay. Again, so did you not see that this was unforeseeable when you accepted? I, I don't. I first and foremost, I don't know how that correlates to our franchise agreement or renewal. But I will say that our kind of brought, our expansion efforts, whether it's here in New York City or throughout the state, are very much in line with the goals that the company set forth after the merger. Does your response to the PSC reflect Spectrum's belief that the conditions placed on the franchise agreement between Spectrum and the city are preempted by federal law and therefore unenforceable? Well, I actually want to remind the Chamber of, of an item that, that do it raised, was that they have no knowledge of our, any infringement by our company as it relates to the two things that the PSC cites. Um, the, the items that the PSC is citing, uh, if you read the public order, it's not steeped particularly in fact. There's nothing for us to point to. We don't agree. Um, and so, you know, on this, we are in agreement with our local regulatory agent that there's nothing to cite or example to cite of any malfeasance on behalf of our company. Well, respectfully, I don't think that's a response. Um, so I'm going to ask again, do you, do you, does your response to the PSC reflect Spectrum's belief that the condition placed on a franchise agreement between Spectrum and the city are preempted by federal law and therefore unenforceable? I don't know if I'm prepared to say that. I actually didn't bring regulatory counsel with me um, since it was a franchise renewal committee. It but all that's, deals with the same but thing. But if that's an item that you want me to look into, I'm happy to follow up with you Great. after the hearing. Great. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understood the question. Did, did, you, did you ask if we were asking if any provision of the franchise were preempted? Do you believe, does your response to the PSC reflect the belief that the conditions placed in a franchise agreement between Spectrum and the city are preempted by federal law and therefore unenforceable. What, what particular provisions of the franchise are you referring to? The provisions that we have, any provision. I don't have it in front of me, but any provision. Well, we, we can, we, uh, I, I work largely on, I'm an attorney with Charter, I work largely on franchise matters. Um, if there's a particular assertion with respect to a preemption of the franchise that you claim was made in papers to the Public Service Commission, if you could let us know explicitly um, what you're referring to, we can be back to you on it. Great. Thank you. Uh, so what steps is Spectrum taking to improve its network and the equipment if it leases to its customers in order to comply with the service benchmark set by the PSC? I, I think that, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure what that question is in reference to. As I said before, that we've responded publicly to the allegations the PSC has assessed and made. We're clearly not in agreement with it. Um, but if you, if in furtherance of kind of what you're seeking, we can certainly defer to regulatory counsel and get those questions for you, Great. answers for you. And the IBEW Local 3 has been on strike for over a year, alleging, among other things, that when Charter took over Time Warner Cable, it demanded that its employees give up their pensions. You're currently engaged in a dispute with the NLRB and do it about whether you are engaging in good faith negotiations with the union. Meanwhile, Charter's CEO is the highest paid CEO the public, of a public company in the United States with an income of 98 million in cash and stocks. That's twice the compensation of the highest paid CEO. Why should regulators believe that Spectrum is engaging in good faith collective bargaining when it proposes to eliminate the pensions of 1,800 technicians and admits to demoting all its general foremen at the same time the com company is profitable enough to pay its top executive more than any other CEO? Sure. I'd like to respond to that, but first my lawyers have instructed me to make the following statement. 
Under established federal law pre precedents, it is unlawful for local governments to use their franchising authority to pressure companies into accepting outcomes at a bargaining table, which federal law leaves to bilateral negotiations between the parties. That said, we want to be responsive to, to the committee and to the elected officials who are inquiring and believe our positions have been fair, so we're happy to discuss them on a very general level. This is in no way a waiver of our federal rights as we continue to reserve all such rights. Um, to your question about uh, whether or not we are bargaining in good faith, the NLRB last November ruled that not only was our company bargaining in good faith, um, but that the two sides had reached an impasse and that um, Charter had every right to implement terms of the contract. And so I would defer to the federal agency with jurisdiction on the matter. What has Spectrum done with the pension funds of the IBEW members and its, and its employees? Since the strike? Yeah. Again, I, I have to say, those are really questions best kind of addressed at the collective bargaining table. What I can say in some ways, um, that item, um, uh, that, to kind of answer your question, we've actually, as of May of last year, um, the JIB, which is the joint interest benefit that houses both the pension fund and the health and wel uh, welfare fund, uh, declined to accept any of our contributions. And in February of this year, um, they made the request that we withdraw permanently from the fund. So we are actually paying um, withdrawal liability. So why has Spectrum demanded that its employees give up their pensions? Um, we are offering a different package. Again, this is, I'm, I'm not at the collective bargaining table. I'm not, I don't have labor counsel, and I don't have those participants here. Um, as it pertains to the franchise agreement, we believe that we're compliant with Article 17 as it pertains to our ability to recognize the rights of a representative from the bargaining unit, um, as well as defer to applicable law on the matter. And has Charter Spectrum undertaken any activities to remove the IBW or any other union from the company? As I said, you know, I don't know how that's germane to the franchise renewal conversation, but I can say that we, from the very beginning, our intent was to collect, to bargain in good faith with Local 3, bring them to the table and have a conversation. It's, we are unable to do so based on Local 3's unwillingness to return to the table. What progress have you made for internet access as part of, a, of the franchise deal? Our franchise doesn't pertain to internet access. Um, but outside of that, I can, I can turn to kind of the one gigabit expansion and the other items that we've done throughout New York City um, to show our kind of focus and investment on broadband and capacity expansion. And has there been any progress with your negotiations with Local 3? We have not been asked by Local 3 who can contact the mediator to return to the collective bargaining table. And what is your timeline then? If, with your negotiations? If, if contacted and notified by the media, we'd return to the table, as we said from last year when this commenced, that we're more than willing to have a conversation and bargain with um, those representatives from Local 3. In May 2017, the New York Times reported that uh, Charter spokesman Justin uh, Venich Venich said uh, President Trump's promise of a lighter regulatory environment enabled the company to commit to locating 20,000 call center jobs in the United States and to spend billions on broadband infrastructure. What regulations has the Trump administration weakened or eliminated since May of 2017 that will accomplish these ends? I'm not familiar with the federal legislation um, Justin was referencing. I know Justin very well. I'm more than happy to kind of clarify that with him. I will say that you know we've been very clear on a national policy um, level that we support many of the initiatives that are shared right here in New York City, but as far as a line by nine analysis of all the policies since May of last year, I'm not here. I can't provide readily today. Okay. Uh, since May of 2017, how many new jobs has Charter and Spectrum added in New York City? Um, I don't know off the top of, of my head how many jobs have been added right here in New York City. Since the merger, we've invested a significant amount of workforce development and workforce expansion, and I can I could more readily pull those numbers post-merger, but since May of last year, I'm not sure. 
Is the company lobbying the Trump administration to obtain regulations that would prevent the state and the city from requiring cable franchisees to collective bargain? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Recently, the Trump administration with charter support eliminated net neutrality. Could you explain the concept of net neutrality? And could you explain how this will affect content creators and consumers in New York State? Sure. Um, again, I know the franchise document doesn't have overview or, or um, to our internet, but I can say that we support, and my understanding of net neutrality is that it, it's, a, it's a term that may mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but in its truest form, it references the openness of the internet. And as a company, we support open internet. We do not block, throttle, or discriminate against lawful content. And so we will continue to kind of promote those principles uh, throughout our footprint. And how often and under what circumstances do you offer free upgrades to cable boxes and other hardwares you provide customers to access your service? I think once they qualify, I don't know how frequently it's done routinely, but you know, if it's if it's something that a customer is qualified to receive, we obviously you know enforce that. Okay. And lastly, uh, how much does it cost to provide basic cable, high-speed internet, and phone service to one residential unit with one phone line, one cable box, and three Wi-Fi devices? I don't know that assessment off the top of my head. I'm sorry. You're asking how much it is for a customer to purchase that or how much it is for us to invest in? No, what is, yeah, what does it cost you to invest? I, that I am not aware of. What are the I medians and mean prices? I'm gonna turn it over to you in one second. Uh, has the New York uh, Public Service Commission ever audited any of your figures when it dealt with your pricing? Um, not to my knowledge. The only the, there's one audit that I'm familiar with, but I'm I since post merger I'm not familiar with that type of audit. Yeah, you should. Um, there there is no rate regulation of cable service in in New York City or anywhere else in New York State. There there has been in the past, but there is not currently. Thank you, uh, thank you for your for your uh, time. I want to turn it over to um, Chair Ku. Thank you, yeah. I just have a, a, a few more questions and because Chair Moya already asked most of the questions already. So, does Charter have any programs to provide cable service to low-income individuals um, or in seniors at a discounted or low rate? And how do this apply to them? Sure. Yes, we do. Um, we have a program called Spectrum Internet Assist, which provides high-speed, low-cost internet packaging for qualifying families. So if you have a senior that qualifies for SSI or a student that qualifies for free or reduced lunch, they would be able to participate um, in that program. So how much is uh, that package is $14.99. For people on low income. Correct. That package, that's the package, and it's, it's $14.99 a month. Yes. The cable franchise fee is based on cable service revenue to provide a cable service. Uh, this fee has decreased over the years. Um, can you speak to uh, why that is the case? Uh, and as a small, small business owner, if I saw my profit go down, I would reevaluate and find a way to increase the profit again. So what is Spectrum doing to increase the uh, subscribers? Two questions there, yeah. Sure, do you want to do the first and I can do the latter? Which one is the first and why, why is why it gone? Why are the um, franchise fees going I, I think you're, uh, where there's uh, generally been a reduction in the number of cable subscribers nationally. Um, people are going uh, to what they call over the top, where they get their video content from means other than cable systems. So that impacts um, the revenues that we receive if the number of customers declines. 
Um, we have uh, spoken to the representatives of Do It in the course of their franchise fee audit um, about certain differences um, in uh, the interpretation of some of the franchise provisions with respect to franchise fees. Um, and that's an ongoing matter as part of the audit. But uh, it's, it's not unusual um, today to see a decline in cable service customers. I just want to say that we take that assessment very seriously and that calculation very seriously. I mean, those are costs that are passed through to our customers. So we want to ensure not only accuracy but feasibility. We're already capped out here in New York City by the maximum amount allowed or permissible to charge for franchise fees. And I think as um, John alluded to, that we are the, the trends that are being seen are a reflection of um, kind of cord cutting and other items that we're witnessing across the nation, not just as it deals with our company. Okay. Uh, as part of your franchise agreement, the franchise agrees to provide cable television uh, service to all residential units in the franchise area. In January of this year, charter filed that you have passed 42,889 additional permits. Uh, but the state determined that more than one quarter of those addresses were supposed to have cable television as of the effect day of the franchise agreement. Can you please provide, uh, provide us with an updated numbers? Oh, I, I don't have the updated numbers in front of me. What I can say, as I think do it referenced before, you know, we don't agree with the PSC's assessment of the count, but whether or not that our numbers included or not will have no impact on our franchise. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, during your testimony, you mentioned many accomplishments uh, that are broadband related. Uh, so, what are you doing uh, to protect New Yorkers from the repeal of net neutrality? Are you doing anything to protect? Uh, we believe in the principles of an open internet. As I said before, we do not block, throttle, or slow down, or um, discriminate against lawful content. Um, and, so, and these have been tenets that we've been abiding by uh, for years. So, um, we'll continue to do so. I finished my questions. I finished my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Ku. I want to now turn it over to the Chair of Land Use, Chair Salamanca, for a few questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Charter, for coming to today's hearing. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I was really disappointed to see the lack of respect from Verizon and Altice not showing up. Uh, but you showed up knowing that you were gonna be in the hot seat and you were gonna get difficult questions, you still came to the table and I thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Um, I have a very basic question that I am trying to get my head wrapped around and that has to do with the audit that Do It did and, and your response. And it has to do with utilizing non-New York City vendors. Okay. And in your explanation here, I mean, you guys even cited, even cited the, um, you cited a dictionary on the word located, located in New York course, City and what it actually means. Correct. To me, someone located in New York City is someone that's established in the city of New York. And it's my understanding that as part of this report, it showed that you were, you, 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 you were utilizing non-New York City vendors or the way you were establishing that they were located in the city of New York was by their address. Mm -hmm. And some of the addresses that were utilized were storage facilities. Sure. I mean, well, can I? Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I want to can I want to address this kind of threefold. First, let me say um, that uh, Do It found us to be compliant um, with this with the terms of the franchise. We have a disagreement around how we're defining located in the city. A couple things I want to note from the very beginning, whether when we were discussing this with Do It through the audit process or across the board, we asked the city the following. Let's say that you believe we're falling short of this requirement. Can you highlight or point to any vendors that we should be using in addition to the ones that we've already highlighted and we've never received a recommendation? The second thing I'll note is um, 
In Dewitt's filing or their response, uh, their dismissal of our claims didn't, so, didn't, wasn't pulled from or called from anything supported in the franchise documents. They decided that the language was too vague, and they came up with their own recommendations ahead of the next steps of another audit that they're going to commence. And hearing that and wanting to work very closely with the city, we've reached out to do it. We've met with them as early as last week to go through how we're calling for vendors, how we're selecting our vendors, and went through internal paperwork that we're using to assure that the responses that we're getting from, from vendors reflects what they're asking. And so we're taking every step to accommodate um, kind of a request that isn't steeped in the franchise agreement, recommendations that the city is coming up with, and we're working very, working very hard in all do candor and respect to kind of address some of those outstanding issues. That being said, without an absence of any recommendation the city can furnish regarding what other vendors we should be using, that inherently assumes that there's a robust list of folks within the arena that we're searching for. And the last thing I'll say, because we kind of addressed it earlier, is that since our kind of labor dispute began, um, we have not increased the use of contractors. And many of the contractors that we utilize are the same contractors that the other telecommunication providers in the city use as well. But if the city wants us to explore other options, if the city wants us to explore an entity that perhaps we're overlooking, we're happy to review it. And the last thing I'll say is, in the list that we gave to do it, in which we highlighted the 20 New York City contractors that we deemed within the city of our list of 26, I think a couple things are noteworthy. The ones that weren't in New York City, they weren't located in Florida or Colorado. They were either in Westchester, they were in Long Island, there were still many of which are, were still here in New York State. I think that's first. Um, the, the second thing I'll highlight that there's the, there was rhetoric earlier about a storage facility not being able to be used or qualified as a site. And we agree. And in documentation that we furnished to the city at our largest storage facilities or sites, we said that based on, the, based on our work with the company and the materials that they furnish about the work that they do there, they're not simply using those sites for storage. But due to the highly technical work that we're talking about, we're talking about assistance with plants, cable wiring or something, or, or things of the like, that entails a sizable storage facility to accommodate the type of work and industry that we lead. But even at those sites, in our publicly filed report, we noted that even those vendors said, much more happens here than the storage of items. But again, I welcome a list of recommendations, and I, we look forward to continue to working with the city as we did last week to discuss next steps in anticipation of the continuation of this audit. Excuse me, if I could just add one point to that, which you should be aware of. Most of this work is done by these contractors either in the streets of the city or at the premises of our subscribers. So these workers, they go to a location, they pick up their assignments, their equipment, and then they go out. Yeah, but let's, let's, be, come on, let's be clear here. I could live in, this, in New Jersey, get a storage uh, unit in New York City, and then it seems that I can, I can be, quote unquote, I'm a, I'm a vendor because the address that I'm using is a storage facility. That's wrong. But that's no, not but the that case is that not, we're, yeah. that's not what we're, we're, what we're um, recommending to you, Mr. Chair, in, in our report. That's not what we substantiate. And let me just say, too, by the own qualifications that do it kind of report to substantiating a New York City vendor, our company in many ways wouldn't even qualify. I mean, despite our presence of stores, base, if you go through the qualifications that they're asking for, majority of workers in that area and so on, Spectrum as a company would not qualify based on what do it put forth as a vendor. So we are trying to work with them and trying to meet them halfway, but in the absence of an example or even review of the merits in which we put forth, again, in the response we received, there was no franchise language leverage to refute our claims. They came up with a new criteria that's not in the franchise franchise document, and we're not even pushing back. As I said, I met with them. We're looking forward to working with them to kind of meet in the middle, uh, but I do want to be kind of fair to what we've kind of furnished to the city, and I think the idea that we gave a list of storage facilities is a mischaracterization of our filing and what we've shared in great candor with Do It. Yeah, any, any, any addresses for companies that we claimed were located in New York City uh, none of them were solely storage facilities. There were other functions performed there, and that was reported to do it. So we have a difference of opinion on that with them. All right. 
So it's fair to say to move on from this conversation that Spectrum or Charter Communication is working with Do It on compliance on hiring New York City based contractors that have a physical presence in New York City. I think it's fair to say that based on Do It's own testimony that we're already in compliance. They did not find us in default of that article, but moving forward, we are looking, we are working towards reviewing their recommendations and working closely with them to get them in line with what they're forecasting for the next audit. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about uh, your, uh, the labor dispute, um, and uh, you may have mentioned it earlier, but I just want some clarity. For the record, what are the main issues of contention in the labor talks between Spectrum and Local 3? As I said before, you know, those conversations are not particularly germane to a franchise renewal process. What I would say, as it's you know, been reported, that I think the main contention is uh, the joint interest benefit, which houses the union's health and welfare fund as well as their pension fund. All right. But I defer to those at the collective bargaining table to sharpen that point for you. And so when was the last offer Spectrum made to Local 3? I, I know that there was some recent interaction, but I'm not sure. I'm not Labor Council. I'm not at the table. All right. And the, the terms that you are offering Local 3, are these similar to agreements you have with other Spectrum employees? We're offering a very competitive practice, a very competitive package, a very generous package, offering to invest thousands of dollars for every employee. Um, we are um, thinking through and um, ways it, raising the minimum wage for any entry level employee upon entering and working with our committee. They will receive our co our company rather. They will receive um, the lowest wage of seventeen dollars an hour, which is four dollars above minimum wage, two dollars above next year's anticipated state minimum wage increase, which is higher than the, which is a 70% increase than the terms of the previous contract. Um, but, you know, those, you know, going into greater detail than that, being more, gener being more general than what I believe to be a very generous offering from our company is something I'm not prepared to do. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I want to now turn it over to Council Member Lansman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So this is a hearing titled Oversight, the city's cable television franchises. So I want to focus on that franchise agreement. The first series of questions I have is I don't understand what you mean or, or what you seem to be suggesting by there being some ambiguity in terms of your obligation to higher vendors that are located in New York City. And if I recall, do its audit, it found that you were, in fact, not hiring vendors that are located in, in New York City. And the language of the franchise, as I understand it, the franchisee shall, to the extent feasible and consistent with applicable law, utilize vendors located in the city for provisions of services under the franchise. Is it your position that under that language of this franchise agreement, which we're here to, to oversee, that a vendor uh, listing an address of, as a, as a, of a storage shed makes them a vendor located in the city? I would kind of, I mean, I'll defer to uh, John, but one thing I will say is if you read the kind of complete assertion of that article in the franchise, there are other qualifiers associated with the use of city vendors um, within that um, within that article, it deals with um, competitive, the competitive nature of the of the industry, pricing, quality no, no, assurances, I, I understand and, and that. other and things. I, and I understand that even in what I what I read to you, I understand that it also says to the extent feasible and consistent with applicable law. Yes. We could yes. have a conversation or a debate about about that, but you seem to be taking the position that a vendor who is using the address of a storage shed for their equipment is a, quote, vendor located in the city. That's not the representation that we're making or re the representation we made in our filing with the city. What we said was the entities that the city deemed were only storage facilities were an incorrect assessment, that those were sites and facilities that were used also for other purposes, and that's the representation that we made. Of the 26 that we furnished, uh, 20, um, we deem to be located here in New York City. But as I said before, to do it and throughout the audit exercise, if there is a vendor that we are overlooking, 
and that the city prefer that we use, as we understand the city employs a diverse array of services and vendors for a slew of different business purposes across the city, we'd be more than willing to review those lists and those options. We've furnished the city and we've been very cooperative. We've given the full list of the entire universe of vendors that we are aware of. I understand. So, so it's not your position that a vendor whose only New York City address is a storage shed is actually a, a, a local vendor? We, we, we did not assert that in our response, no. Well, I'm not sure that that's what, what, what Dewitt understood your response to be, and, and they did find you. We, it, with respect to every vendor that we asserted was located in New York City, we listed the functions that we believed were performed at those locations, and none of those 20 that Camille referenced was the exclusive function a storage facility. There were some that did have storage facilities, but they performed other functions there as well. And the storage facility is, in many cases, necessary for them to perform the work that they, they, uh, they're performing. You know, for of us. course, it's vendors need to, to, to store their stuff somewhere. We all get that. It's, it's, and they also dispatch workers from that location. And it's obviously very convenient to have your f equipment stored where you dispatch your workers from. So they've got a storage shed. They store their stuff there. That's where the guys show up in the morning to get dispatched from. That is a local vendor? If that's that, a New York City vendor? That's a dispatch. Uh, if that's a dispatch facility, they're, they're, they're not going to perform their work at the vendor's location. They're going to perform their work on our system in the rights of way of the city or they're going to perform their work in the premises of our customers. That's where they perform their work. The type of work they do is not performed at their own location. That definition or understanding of located in New York City makes the, this section of the, of the franchise agreement completely uh, um, uh, irrelevant and, and meaningless. Because, of, of course, the work is going to be performed in New York City, that's, why the, that's where the franchise agreement is with. But, but what we said as our definition, which I think is what the words clearly mean, is that the vendor or contractor has a location in New York City from which they conduct business. Yeah, but the problem is the only business they were conducting was the provision of this service, which necessarily had to be in New York City because that's where the franchise agreement is. The term in the franchise agreement is utilize vendors located in the city. Mm -hmm. The vendor that's located in the city is one that is located in the city, doing business in the city, has some operations and, and, and some kind of, if not, if not the headquarters, some kind of base in the city, separate and apart from sending folks in to do this work, which necessarily is in the city. And I think that's what Dewitt found. Well, I, think what we, I think we'd agree with you on a lot of what you said, uh, but I'd certainly not headquartered in the city. I don't think this is a, this is a prohibition on using. No, I, uh, I, I, I expressly said not necessarily the headquarters. OK. Sure. Um, but yes, we, what, that's, the, that's the, the meaning I believe that we, we used, is that they had a location and they were conducting business from it. Well, I think that is a very strained reading of located in the city. Let's move on. Another section of the franchise agreement, which has been the subject of much discussion this morning and afternoon, is Article 17.1 of uh, the, the labor agreement. Now, this franchise agreement was to some extent negotiated, signed on to by your predecessor, Time Warner, correct? That's correct. Okay. And when Charter Spectrum took over, you were bound by this franchise agreement just as Time Warner was, Agreed. correct? Agreed. Okay. And this franchise agreement says, Article 17.1, franchisee shall not dominate, interfere with, participate in the management or control of, or give financial support to any union or association of its employees. 
Now, can we agree, do you agree, that providing support for an effort to decertify the bargaining unit as the bargaining representative would represent an effort to dominate or interfere with the union? We're not, we're, not, we're not supporting the effort you're referencing, and we would defer to the NLRB. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't, we didn't get to that yet. That's a different question, whether or not you're supporting the effort. We're gonna, we'll talk about that. I want to understand whether, whether you agree that whoever is the franchisee, mm -hmm. Time Warner, you, whoever, whoever might be after you, and as long as it's this franchise agreement, that an effort to decertify the union that you as the franchisee or the franchisee is supporting or involved with would be a violation of this section of the franchise agreement. What we would say, I believe, and I'm not a labor attorney, is that this provision is consistent with elements and provisions of federal law, and we are in compliance with it, and we are in compliance with federal law, and there's been no finding to the contrary. I agree. Okay, but that's a different question. Do you, do you acknowledge that if you were, or whoever the franchisee was, um, dominated, was, was involved in a, a decertification effort, that that would violate the terms of this article? Can, can we at least agree on that? Not saying you, you are. I understand the NLRB hasn't ruled on that. I just want to understand if, if we have, we're on the same page of what this, from my perspective, the plain terms of this franchise agreement means. This and the other provisions of 17.1, as we said, incorporates provisions of, of federal law, and we believe we are in compliance with it, with federal law, and therefore the franchise. Okay. Who is Bruce Carberry? Who? Bruce Carberry, the individual, the employee of Spectrum Charter, who filed a decertification petition with the NLRB. I don't know who that is. Do you know whether he's an employee of, of Charter I, Spectrum? I, I've never heard the name I'm not, before. I'm not involved in, in what, you're, what you're referencing. If that's something, if you want us to confirm employment of, an, of someone, your name, we can certainly do that. I can't do that right okay. here. Okay, so you can confirm that for me. I can, I can confirm employment okay. if you want and, to know if someone and, works and at our company. Can you confirm for me Mr. Carberry's uh, um, title at Spectrum? Not today. No, that no, is. I, un I understand. That's not germane to kind of a franchise renewal process, and I would have it, to. Do wait, say that again. What's not germane to what? You're saying you're asking me to confirm the name and title, and I'm assuming some more questions about a particular worker. And what I'm saying is, I and let, maybe you can explain to me. I don't know what that has to do with franchise renewal, sure. I, which I came prepared to discuss. But I can, at the end of this hearing, go back to our legal team and see from an HR perspective what we're allowed to share about any employee that works for us to a public forum. I'm not privy to that right now. So I'm, I'm happy to explain to you why it is germane. As I said at the start, this is a hearing to oversee the franchise agreement um, with Charter. Sure. And in the franchise agreement, there's a section that prohibits the franchisee from interfering with the, um, the bargaining unit. Of course. Mr. Carberry uh, purports to be a technician okay. at um, Spectrum mm -hmm. who has filed a decertification sure. petition with the NLRB. His status as an employee, whether or not in fact he was put up to file that decertification petition by Charter is relevant and germane to whether or not Charter is violating Article 17.1 of the Franchise Agreement. Well, two points to that. One is the NLRB ruled that we were, what you're alleging was not the case a few weeks ago and that the petition was legally filed. Um, so I, I didn't come prepared to discuss any aspects of that because we are compliant with the provision that you just noted per the NLRB ruling. If you have HR questions about any employee that reports to whether it's Charter Communications Corporate or Spectrum as a field tech, I'm just being fair to you, uh, Mr. Councilman, like, I have to ask our labor attorneys and our HR representatives 
services. I'm not privy to how much I can share about any individual who works for Charter in an open hearing format, um, but I can look into it. But per the NLRB, who, roomed, who ruled compliance on that matter, I did not come prepared today to refute the claims of the federal body that has sole jurisdiction over labor relations. Will you be able to get us information on whether or not at any point Mr. Carberry was in fact a supervisor? I will be able to consult with our attorneys and see what I can share about any worker who is under the employee of Spectrum and report that up. Can you tell us whether or not Spectrum did in fact put Mr. Carberry up to filing the decertification petition and whether or not Spectrum provided or Charter provided any assistance to Mr. Carberry in filing that petition? I would like to cite the NLRB's ruling which said that that was not the case. And um, is, is, is that your testimony though, that, that is, Charter that is, did that not? Is, that is my testimony that I am not privy to any malfeasance on behalf of the company and as was ruled by the NLRB, no such action occurred, yes. And, and if I told you that, that Mr. Carberry was a supervisor, at least according to his, his own LinkedIn page at uh, Charter, at Spectrum, and then when he filed the decertification petition mm -hmm. as a technician, mm -hmm. that that looks like that he was put up to file that decertification petition on behalf of the company. Does that um, um, strike you? or add to your knowledge about whether or not Privy to Mr. Carberry was uh, put up or assisted by no. Spectrum in, in filing that petition? No, I, I'm not privy to the details you're citing here today. These are matters certainly that are left to, to our Labor Council, none of which are here today. Um, our company, I think, um, has been very clear as far as the tone that it's taking with the decertification process, which is that we have no involvement. And that's what the NLRB confirmed just a few weeks ago. But again, if you have very tailored HR questions, I'm happy to go back to my team and see what, if anything, can be shared about any Spectrum employee. Okay. Um, continuing to focus on this issue of Charter's involvement or potential involvement in the decertification effort, do, do, do you know who Matthew Antonek is. Oh. My understanding is he's an attorney who, I could be wrong, but my understanding is he's an attorney who represented or assisted Mr. Carberry in filing that decertification petition? Not familiar with that at all. As I said before, I came prepared today to discuss um, the renewal and the oversight of our franchise agreement. I'm not privy to the HR items that you're citing or you're noting. If there's something you want us to go back and discuss with counsel, we can, I, but I'm not, I'm not at liberty to discuss the items that you're raising. I'm not privy to this at all, and I'm in no position to speak on behalf of our legal team or labor counsel that's not here today. Well, I mean, you're the one here representing Charter. I, I can't make you divulge information that you don't have, and I don't expect you to know every nook and of cranny of, of Charter and Spectrum and, and its operations. But you're I asking me about I, an employee that I'm not familiar with and the name of an outside um, lawyer that he may or may not have used when the NLRB has already ruled on this. So I'm just trying to be fair to you. I'm, I, I'm not only am I not privy to those details, but I'm in no discussion, I'm in no position to discuss any of those items given the scope of the hearing and the um, ruling set forth by the NLRB. And so, but if I, there are things that you want me to go back to my company and see if there's an opportunity to have a lengthier conversation about the, the greater specificity that you're inquiring, I'm not pushing back on that. I will, of course, go back and report up and see what, if anything, we are at liberty to discuss. Right. No, so, I, I, so let me, yes, I don't mean sure. to know. I just want to be clear because we're not asking about compliance with labor law here. I think what my, my colleague here is, we're trying to figure out whether or not your company um, is acting in good faith with respect to Article 17. Sure. But you keep going back to arguing whether or not this is, this is a labor law issue, and that's not what we're saying right here. We're asking whether or not you are complying in good faith, and that's in the line of questioning in which... Yeah. I agree with that, and I just want to highlight that, as Dewitt said earlier, they did not find that we weren't in compliance. So what you're asking me is to substantiate a claim that do it doesn't claim of our company, that the NLRB doesn't claim of our company, and you want me to share supporting information that 
kind of goes in a different direction, I'm saying I'm unable to do so. The regulatory agency that it oversees our cable franchise here in the city has not deemed an issue of noncompliance as it pertains to that article. For, in furtherance of that fact, the NLRB, which is federally mandated to review that, hasn't either. So I'm not trying to be kind of difficult in our interaction. I want to be very mindful and respectful of the body, but it's simply not within the scope of what I was prepared to discuss today. And given the rulings by not only our local regulatory agency, but by the NLRB, there was no clear indication that I would have to be, I would have to be prepared to discuss that now, today. I just want to clarify, is, is it your position that the NLRB, NLRB has ruled that um, Charter Spectrum did not um, commit a fair labor practice, a violation uh, in, in, in participating in, in the, the decertification effort? Because my understanding is the ruling from the NLRB was much more narrow. It was just that, in fact, Mr. Carberry is an employee of Spectrum, but not that the NLRB has made a decision as to whether or not Spectrum improperly involved itself in the decertification effort. So I, I just want to understand, because you seem to be saying, and I want to give you this opportunity to, to, to clarify, maybe I misunderstood, you seem to be saying that the NLRB has determined that Charter did not participate or assist in the decertification campaign as Local 3 alleges that it did. I, I don't think either Ms. Joseph or I are um, terribly familiar with um, the order of the NLRB. I think what we know is that they upheld the petition. Um, but uh, we certainly can say that there's been no finding by the NLRB the charter did anything in I understand that the, the, in the case is pending the matter is pending my understanding is the matter I, I, is pending I, I honestly don't know whether it it's it's pending or that it has it, it has been resolved or um, well I, I believe Ms. Joseph my understanding is that the petition was approved and then the next step would be um, kind of um, whatever the due process is around the votes, but that the petition that was filed was approved. Right, but it, it's not your contention that Local 3's uh, complaint that char uh, Charter violated the, the, the National Labor Relations Act by assisting and participating in that decertification petition has been uh, determined one way or the other. I, I don't think I'm following the framing of your question, but I, what I can say is I can ask Labor Council's not here, so I don't want to be misleading. If that is if that is a pointed kind of assertion that you want me to clarify with Labor I, Council, right. I can. Because I, I, can I, do thought, is I thought that I, I thought that I heard you say, well, the NLRB has decided this already. It, it has confirmed the petition right, but, and approved but, but, the vote. I am not confirming... familiar with any NLRB ruling at this juncture that cites any malfeasance or involvement or company in anything um, unethical. I am not familiar so, with that. So I'm not saying there is. It, it hasn't, my understanding is that issue hasn't been decided yet. So in light of the fact, if I am correct, that the issue of charters um, Im allegedly improper involvement in the decertification process has not yet been decided by the NLRB, and we as the council are charged with overseeing the franchise agreement, huh. that you can get me certain information that would be relevant to me as a council member, the committee, the body, to be able to determine, independent from the NLR NLRB, whether or not charter is in violation of 17.1 of the franchise agreement, specifically as it relates to whether or not Charter improperly Was dominated, right? interfered with, or participated in this, the, 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 the bargaining unit sure. by, by, by engaging or being involved in the decertification campaign. All I can say is that is not my understanding, but I can go back to Labor Council. I mean, I talk a lot, but I'm not an attorney. So I can like go back. I, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. I said I talk a lot, but I'm not an attorney. I have no legal authority to speak on this matter on behalf of the company. I can only defer you to the NLRB judgment and say that given the questions that you are now citing, I can bring back to my company and see if there's anything that we can share related to the matters that you are raising. Okay. And, and I, I do believe yes. the NLRB is the appropriate forum for the 
resolution of these types of issues under federal I, law. I understand that's your opinion, and you're entitled to it. And my opinion, which I'm entitled to, course, is that course. do it as the administrator of the franchise agreement is responsible for making an independent judgment as to whether or not the clauses and articles of the franchise agreement are being, are being followed. Um, and that us as the council, mm -hmm. most importantly for, for me and us this morning, we have a responsibility to make an independent judgment and not to contract that out for want of a better term to some other entity, let alone a, a federal of course. entity. Um, I I'm not agreeing. sure it's contracting out, but it's federal, the federal agencies have authority that they have without your contracting no, it out. No, but the, the contracting out comes from the provision of the franchise agreement that requires certain labor standards, et cetera, and whether or not we are going to look and see and determine whether or not those provisions are being sure. adhered to as opposed to well, if the NLRB says they are, then they are, and if the NLRB says they're not, then they're not. Otherwise, I don't know if you were here earlier, I, as I said to do it, this whole paragraph could have just said, well, depending on what the NLRB says. And I, again, I'm not pushing back. We will share your recommendations with our Labor Council. I, I think what just uh, John was referencing is that Dewitt hasn't found or cited the claim you're claiming, nor has the NLRB. Given what you're raising now, because we're not at liberty to discuss in great detail what you're asking, we'll go back and we'll look into what we can share. All right. Okay, um, last question. Are you familiar with, any, with an entity called, I think it's the, well, not the employee, the employee rights group? Sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of your the question. The employee account. rights group? Are you familiar with I'm the employee familiar. advisory group or the employee rights group or its involvement in any way, shape, or form with the decertification campaign? I'm not familiar with that group or organization. I'm okay. sorry. All right. Um, well, we have a lot of follow-up to send your way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one quick question. Um, does Charter Spectrum plan to coordinate with Altice and Verizon um, when preparing a response to the next uh, cable television franchise authorizing resolution? Uh, and if so, have you guys already been in discussion or in communication? We plan on working I'm with Altice and Verizon. Could you repeat the question? I wasn't quite clear what. Do you, do you plan to coordinate with Altice and Verizon on a response? for uh, the next authorizing resolution? We have, we have no plans at all like that that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. And I want to thank you uh, all for your testimony today. Uh, thank you for coming. Again, I just want to note uh, that you did attend this hearing and the other two companies uh, failed to come uh, in front of this body uh, and it will be noted uh, as we go in the future. So thank you very much. And thank you, thank you Chair day. Moya. Thank you. thank you, Chair Ku and members of the council. So for the next panel, I'd like to call up uh, Troy Wolcott, Michelle Alamen, Derek Jordan, Marvin Billups, Thank you. Um, we're going to have the council swear you in. Please state your names one by one. Thank you. 
Derek Jordan. Troy Walcott. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony, testimony before the committee and in response to all council member questions? I do. Yes. yes. Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Derek Jordan. Um, I'm the business representative for Local Union Number 3 and for the 1,800 members on strike against Charter Spectrum. I submit this testimony at this oversight hearing of the New York City Council on New York City's cable franchises. As the members of council and this committee are aware, Local Union Number 3 IBEW workers is in a protracted strike against Charter Communications cable franchises entities such as Spectrum. The strike began over Charter's negotiating position that essentially were taken away much of health, welfare, and pension benefits of Local 3 workers, as well as adversely affecting a variety of work rules and related terms and conditions. Local 3 would not surrender to such requests, and a strike, which is now more than a year plus, began and is ongoing. But recently, the true purpose of Charter's actions became clear, to decertify Local 3 as the bargaining agent for its workforce. I want to provide this council with a perspective on this action to others of Charter that evidence that it is not the type of entity that the progressive New York City should want to do business with. It's no accident that New York City State Public Service Commission has three separate proceedings reached either preliminary or final conclusions that Charter has failed willfully and intentionally to live up to its commitment and obligations to the state some of which related to the numbers and types of workers to be located in the state, and others related to the extent of charters building out its infrastructure that it is committed in, to New York State to do. In addition to a presently ongoing proceedings, the Public Service Commission seeking as a remedy for charters alleged misconduct, which the Public Service Commission alleged may include the um, intentional failure to pay all monies the charter otherwise is supposed to pay to the city, the taking away of charters New York City franchises. It is also seeking to rescind its approval of charter communications merger with Time Warner Cable, the successor. Also important is the New York State Attorney General's lawsuit against Charter Spectrum for alleged violations of New York State regarding willful misinterpretations to consumer concerning internet access services, including uploading and downloading speeds. Accordingly, the New York State Attorney General's Office, thousands of New Yorkers, if not hundreds of thousands, have been defrauded, and many of those are located right here in New York City. Finally, this council has received testimony from Do It that even it, though very late in the game, believes that there are issues with Charter's conduct under its New York City cable franchises. These include the use of certain workers and independent contractors that may be at odds with Charter's franchises, as well as what Do It inexplicably refers to as irregularities in Charter's payments of franchise commissions. All of the above evidence that Charter is, to use the term vernacular, a corporate no good nick. But I submit to this council if one of New York City cable franchises is engaged in misconduct, particularly with respect to paying commission, should we think that Charter is unique, unusual? I submit no. Also, what's would do it? It has had the allegations of the state attorney generals for almost a year and a half. Why has this agency not done its own investigation? Do it has had the Public Service Commission's different proceedings and allegations for almost a year. What has it been doing? Is this, super, is this the supervising agency of charter? Do its tepid audit of charter, only done because of the command of Mayor de Blasio, suggests that do it either is incapable of adequately policing, I'm sorry, uh, policing its corporate franchises or it's indifferent to its regulatory oversight power and its content to cede to the state government. Can the council be content with the agency's oversight? I think not. Let me conclude by linking it all to what Local 3 strike is about and what Charter stands dramatically opposed to, the dignity of city workers and their desire to have a decent wage, decent benefits, and the modicum of job protection. If this council believes in true progressism, if the mayor does as well, then both must look at how Charter conducts itself against its own union workers as well as against its own city consumers. 
There is a direct line there, and the city must put pressure on Charter as well as to conclude that in the future it does not want to do business with Charter. In addition, the council should want to ensure a city that encourages and protects the dignity of workers and not reward corporate actors that do not. If the city of Seattle can do so, why not this city? The mayor says we are a progressive city. The speaker does too. So how can the government of the city suffer a corporate actor, a city franchisee such as Charter? It should not, it must not, and it cannot. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you. My name is Troy Walcott. I want to tell you what I hear daily from the people that call me. My daughter's starting college. I promised her I would help her. I'm about to lose my house I saved all my life for. I can't lose my medical coverage. My child has special needs. I have to file for bankruptcy. I'm losing everything. These are the calls I have to receive daily from an entire workforce fighting for their lives because they're trying to fight for what is right. Spectrum would like to have you believe that 1,800 men and women are doing this because they offered us more money than we asked for. That would be great if we were just looking today at money only, but we're looking to try to have provide um, ourselves and our families future benefits. I'm a New Yorker born and raised in Brooklyn. New York has changed a lot in a small amount of time, but I never thought I'd see the day change where an outside company could come into New York and push around its people, workforce, elected official, and then dare them to do something about it. I know that the standard perception of a union dispute is or fight over money. This is not that. This is about a company looking to eradicate the union so they can send a message that they're willing to do anything to destroy any voice working people have. We sacrificed for over 40 years of wages to contribute towards our benefits. That's the reason, this, that's the reason we fight so hard for this. It's not for something that was given to us, it's something we spent 40 years paying for. 40 years of sacrificing wages for benefits. 40 years investing to our union benefit plan that gives us our strength. This is also the reason com the Spectrum's goal is to eliminate it. Corporations look to point out our differences between us to make us fight against each other and distract from them taking away from us day by day more and more as they continue to get richer and richer off of our work. We fight each other, but they see us as all the same, a working class stiff. Our benefits as workers continue to fade while profits for corporations continue to increase. They think because we work with our hands that we don't have people working under us that we're beneath them. I would like to tell you, Spectrum, that the company that, and the companies that would like to follow your blueprint, because you have more money than us, that doesn't make you better than us. It is apparent by their tone that the concept is difficult for Spectrum to understand. At the bargaining table, they told us they know what our people want. We want cash in our pockets, not promises of benefits. They say this because this is what they believe about working people. They told us point black at the negotiating table. They promised on their mother's grave we will never get back our medical and retirement plan for our families. When it gets to that point, how can you say this is about business anymore? This is, this is only about Spectrum's attempt at union busting, and it's starting with New York City. Spectrum has hired a large amount of out-of-state workers claiming that they work here because they have storage units in New York. Apparently, it seems also misrepresenting their revenue, possibly cheating the city out of franchise fees. Spectrum agreed to a merger agreement in New York and agreed to build out to underserved portions of the city. Now, just as they chose to do with us at the negotiating table, they're reinterpreting the meaning of that agreement to avoid their commitments. What's even more bold is that they now tell the city that they should be lucky of what they've done so far. It seems they have no problem bending or even breaking any agreement or terms they see fit, then dare us to sue them to make it right. I've never witnessed such blatant disrespect in the face of our city or our elected officials. One of the first things they said when they came into the city is that customers were, paying, were not paying enough for their cable bill, and that set the tone for them moving forward. Yet, they have nothing to say regarding the lawsuit filed by the Attorney General for lying to customers by advertising and charging customers extra for higher speeds they knew they couldn't provide. The city has now had the opportunity after two years to see their deficiencies and their lies. It only took us a couple of days to see what they were about once they changed everything we had just discussed at the bargaining table immediately after we left it. Corporations have amassed such wealth they could care less about what any of us think, you or us or the customers. Our American dream is slipping away into their bank accounts. 
What this company is doing is only able to happen because of the monopoly they hold in the city. Customers have no choice and neither do the workforce. We call this a union town, but show no sense of urgency when the main thing that makes it what it is is under direct attack. There's no longer a question of why Spectrum is doing it. It's clear that the only concern is union busting. So if so many on our side in a union town built and maintained by unions, why are we allowing what this company is doing to us and the rest of New York to happen and continue for so long? Our elected officials have spoke of how this is a union town and it's not going to happen here, but it's happening and they're daring you to do something about it. These cable companies hold us hostage because they feel we have no other choice to deal with them. It's time to show them otherwise. We are partly to blame because we, the people, who are supposed to support the efforts of our elected officials, don't do the simplest thing we can to support you, and that's vote. We both have to work to restore that faith in each other again. Working people have gone unheard for long enough. The honest, truth, the honest truth is, if this city wanted to actually pull down the full weight of the city of New York on charter communications, I believe they could. Who would have thought that time, experience, and knowledge that we have would have, and, um, that we have would have been sacrificed just to try to eliminate the union, especially when it's at the expense of the customers of New York City? We underestimated Spectrum's blatant disregard for what their customers or New York City thought of what they were doing. This unrest was Spectrum's mission from the very beginning and they won't easily let anyone stop them. Not Local 3, the customers, the employees, no agreement they made, not even the city itself will stop them from trying to achieve that goal. The better question is will you? Will you allow them to threaten, bully, and trample on what our city is all about? Every day that goes by that nothing is done, you allow them to do just that. Every day that that happens, we suffer more. 15 months is a long time to be on strike and it's not easy. The easy thing would have been to go back to work and just move on. But that wouldn't have been in the best interest of the futures of ourselves or our families, so we couldn't do that. The hard thing to do is to stay out and fight for our principles, which is what we've been doing for the past 15 months. This company has taken steps to move their greed to a new level. I ask you now to stop them. We must send a collective message as a city to anyone else who sees it as profitable to stamp on the future of working men and women who still believe in the American dream that it won't be allowed and definitely not starting here in New York. The last thing I ask you is for all the elected officials, can you all agree now not to renew any franchise you feel is not living up to the spirit of the agreement and make them work to get it back over the next two years? You need no law to tell a bad tenant that you're not renewing their lease. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michelle Alemang. I live in the Bronx of New York. <clears throat> I've been employed with Spectrum Time Warner since April 18, 2008. I've been an active local three member since 2008. Me and 1,800 workers went on strike on March 27, 2017. When I began at Spectrum, which was then Time Warner Cable, I started as a service technician, learning basic troubleshooting for residential homes. In the years that followed, I wanted to learn more about the backbone of the company. So when I received the opportunity, I joined the construction department and built knowledge on maintaining New York's cable system, maintaining a system that is old and fragile. <clears throat> By the ninth year, I had moved up to our fiber department in which I became certified and took on a new f field of knowledge to keep up the fast-paced technology in this city. For all my time on the job, I looked forward to tomorrow because of the opportunity through my bargaining agreement to move up and be the best all-around technician for New York City residents and business owners. Because I was a union member, I knew that I wouldn't be treated poorly by my employer, that my wages and benefits and related job security would allow me and my family to have a decent life. In exchange for that, I work hard to always be the best at my job. Local 3's bargaining agreement allowed me to have the proper medical necessary for testing and treatment for both my chronic asthma and outpour syndrome, which is a disease that affects my kidneys. <clears throat> for 40 years, we've worked together with the understanding that Local, 3, Local 3's members overexert our bodies to keep our New York City residents and business occupants happy. As a, unit, we fight, as a unit, we fight through all weather in a city full of blizzards, hurricanes, heat waves, and freezing temperatures, 
Working in these conditions, we deserve the best, not good, medical and proper retirement. Now it seems that management and owners of Charter want to take away what we, as hardworking New Yorkers, deserve. I was willing to strike to preserve what I, consider, what I considered a decent job. Now I hear, now I know that Charter wants to make itself a non-union shop. If this council believes in the dignity of, worker, of workers and the inherent value of workers' labor, then you will do everything in your power to cause Dewar to examine with the laser beam Charter's business. If the state attorney general and the PSC are right, then Dewar is, is going to find what us as employees have been trying to say correct. But unless the city, unless the council makes do it act and stay on it to do so, I fear the charter will be getting one over on all of us, men and women in the city, and on all of you. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Marvin Billups, and I'm from Harlem. I began my career as an apprentice installer when I was 19 years old at Paragon Cable. I was a young husband and father and tried to approach my job with respect and integrity. Paragon noticed that I was young yet responsible and eager to learn. By my fifth year, my family and I were selected to be the face of a campaign for the year of 1994. My face was on the side of the cable trucks and in the bus shelters. My family was featured in print ads and a short commercial. I was so proud to work for a company that recognized my efforts and provided me with opportunities. After years of mastering my craft, I earned the title of foreman, where I was trusted to train and guide the technicians in my department, such as like Michelle. In my department, I encouraged pride of work, accountability, and could develop a well-trained team with great work ethics. I convinced them that we worked for a great company that recognizes hard work and dedication. I guess I was wrong. I can recall a specific time in my life where I realized years later how beneficial it was to be a part of a union. When my daughter, who was an infant, she suffered from a serious, serious gastrointestinal issue that required many expensive tests, hospital stays, including ambulance rides and equipment at home to monitor her. During those difficult times, I was never denied courage for insurance for any of her needs, and they were extensive. Being a young father and at the time, not making a whole lot of money, it was comforting not to have pressure of how her care was going to be paid for. I didn't realize the value until after speaking to others that the coverage, different than mine, and hearing the horror stories of denied claims and big out-of-pocket expenses that I truly began to appreciate the benefit and protection provided by my union. I am happy and proud to say that today my daughter is an adult and serves the city of New York as an NYPD officer. My union made sure that she was taken care of and we had everything we needed. My family has benefited from being part of a union. My family has benefited from being part of something that shows you how to take pride in what you do and to always do your best no matter what the circumstances. I liked my job. I felt that I was helping the company and the people who work its customers. The wages were steady and the benefits were good. I had the union to protect my job security if I didn't screw up. After so many years on the job in the cable industry in this town, I didn't think that the change in ownership from TWC to Charter would change the nature of my job and the work experience I had for all the years of service. I figured that if I did my job and did it well, I would continue to receive the good wages and benefits that I had in the past. Imagine my shock and surprise when I learned that Charter wanted to take all of that away from me and my brothers and sisters in Local 3. For my working life as a union member, I was productive. I was a productive person in society and the city. Now Charter wants to change all of that. I and the 1,800 workers of Spectrum and all our extended families, your constituents, have now been left out, by, left out to dry by Charter. This council's franchisee this council's franchisee, I hope that you will do all in your power to help me and my fellow local three members get back to work. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, one quick question for any one of you. Since last May, has the union had any negotiations with Spectrum? 
Uh, we haven't had any formal negotiations since December 20th. And is, has Spectrum engaged in any activities that the union believes violated the provisions of the franchise agreement? Uh, well, we don't feel they were bargaining in good faith. We still maintain that they're not bargaining in good faith. And if so, has the union brought up these concerns to do it, the PSC, uh, the NLRB? Um, and if so, what has been their response? Um, there are currently five pending NLRB uh, cases. Um, and, you know, again, those are still um, uh, being worked on. Um, there, I believe there has been um, questions submitted to do it. Um, and I believe those questions were also submitted to the committee. Um, and, you know, as far as I know, we haven't gotten any formal answers on that. Okay. Th thank you very much. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Richards. I want to thank you all for um, your time and your testimony today. It's truly appreciated by this body. Uh, all of the work that you have done to bring uh, a lot of these issues uh, to light for us here. We want to thank you um, for this uh, opportunity to hear your testimony today. Thank You're you. welcome, and we thank you, and Local 3 thanks you also. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I would like to call up the next panel, uh, Mary uh, Reni, how do you say it? Ren Rens Rens Rensinger? Greta Byron, Iris Cortez, and Marianne Gibson. Second. We did this hearing last year. Yep, we called um, Marion Gibson, Iris Cortez, Greta Byron, and Mary. Okay. Did Did you submit? Um, We have Mary Ann, we have Mary. And Mary. Yeah. That one, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to let you know that we're keeping it to, to two minutes, so. You go over, it's okay, but Good we afternoon. want you to keep. Yes. My name is Marianne Gibson. I am a resident of Village Care, which is a um, assisted living facility in Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen. And I'm here today really to um, ask the council to help us in getting a senior citizen discount at Village Care, basically to get us a senior citizen count around the city, discount around the city. The residents in our facility are all senior citizens, and we're all on fixed incomes. And this means that in, our, this, in this stage of our lives, we're facing higher costs all over the place, but our incomes basically are remaining the same. So what we're constantly doing is struggling to make ends meet. And TV happens to be very important to us. The, Energy level is not what it used to be for any of us at the, at the facility, nor is agility one of our strong points. So we rely on TV not only to provide us with information and keep us in touch with what's going, around, going on around the world, but it's also a means of giving us entertainment and filling up time during the day. So it becomes really essential to most of us. And unfortunately, we don't have the option of shopping around with, to competition and finding good service at lower prices because basically there is no competition for us. Mm -hmm. Spectrum has monopoly in our area. Yes. 
And so we're asking Spectrum to please join other private corporations, private and public corporations like MTA, like movie theaters, like supermarkets, like drugstores, and give us a generous discount to deal with our situation. And more than that, we really need your help. So we're begging for it to try and help us get what we need from Spectrum. Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Iris Cortez, and I am 73 years old. I taught for 49 years, and what I come to ask is for help, just the same as Mary. We both live in the same place. We, we know that the economy is high, but guess what? We worked for so many years, and we don't feel that we're entitled, we don't feel that we're entitled to, please forgive me, I, I am born and raised in Puerto Rico. Where we come from, we treat our senior citizens with respect, with dignity. And it's the first thing that we put online. We're only asking for something that we work for, something that we have all worked for. And if you have grandparents, and I know you do, then listen to us, because someday you will be in our place, begging for something that you have worked all your life for. We have tenants that only get $50 a month once they pay their rent. Cable, I pay for cable $150. And that means that we have nothing left to spend. This is not your problem. We're just giving you a reason why. Why do we have to go through this? Most of us have worked all our lives. We don't, Spectrum does not care for their workers. Spectrum does not care. And I have called Spectrum. I have, I call Time Warner. I ask for a special package. They have nothing, nothing at all for senior citizens. So just remember, you will be in our place, in our position, if we don't do something now. Thank you. Iris, maybe you can you want to move up a little bit. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I'm from Community and Labor United, and we're organizing a boycott against Spectrum because Spectrum has violated every single tenant of, of their existence. They um, increased, they are unfair to labor, as you have pointed out, and they are unfair to their customers because they jack up, they um, start with a low rate and then they jack up the prices three times. And it's just not fair to the customers. Um, I wanted to say while well, the Spectrum people were here that it's not important that they, they don't, they, they, um, shouldn't negotiate with the Public Service Commission or with the NLRB. They, they should, collective bargaining means that you discuss things with your union, and they haven't done that. And I think they should. And we find out in our leafleting and talking to the community members that the community supports the union, and the community is very much against Spectrum Cable. We just want to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. Just one quick question. So. Uh, in, in their testimony earlier today, Spectrum said that they offer senior discounts at fourteen ninety nine. Are you not receiving that no. at all? That's, first of all, I mean, the taxes are something that fourteen ninety nine is taxes on that and it becomes $30, but that, neither here nor there about that. Fourteen ninety nine is something they put on TV. And if you call and ask about $14.99, you've got to take exactly that package, which amounts to basically nothing. I mean, if you have them already and you say, I want to go down to this or I want to go down to that, forget it, you can't go down anywhere. You have to be a new customer that's now taking this package and you get it for a year. You're never notified at the end of the year. You have to make sure you keep, keep track of what time, what the time is, so that you call and cancel, otherwise your bills all mm. automatically goes right. up. I had one of those deals, and it was nothing like $14.99. In addition to which, I've called them, 
I have only TV from them. I've called them and asked them, because I wanted Wi-Fi in my room, if I could add internet. They wanted $55 to add internet to my TV, which is ridiculous. I mean, uh, right. it's, um, they're not easy to deal with. And, and we have tried at Village Care to contact them and get some kind of a discount. And it's really a deaf ear that you're talking to, which is why we really need the help of the council. Yes. If thank possible. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your, your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, uh, Chair Koo, uh, Committee Council, and the Technology and Land Use Staff. Oh. So, wow. That was like. Last um, minute. I know. We are joined by the great Chair of Parks, Council Member Barry Gredenchek. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to really thank the staff uh, for uh, technology and land use uh, for all the hard work that they did uh, to make this hearing happen. Uh, and thank you all. This meeting uh, is hereby adjourned. Boy, that was. Uh, hey, Barry, you just finished over there? Uh, 227. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Army Corps went on and. Um, yeah, no, it worked. It worked.